uh, chairmanship uh, this afternoon, and I beg to move uh, that this House uh, has considered uh, carrier strike strategy and its contribution to UK uh, defence. May I, at the outset, uh, refer the House to my uh, declaration of uh, members' interests. Uh, may I also thank uh, two colleagues, uh, the Honourable Member for Stoke North uh, and the Honourable Member for uh, Berwick-upon-Tweed, who have co-sponsored this debate with me. Uh, Mr Sharma, we're hoping to bring a trident of points uh, towards <laughs> you today, uh, and I'm hoping that we will be dealing one of them uh, each ourselves, uh, being uh, the strategy for operating large carriers, which I uh, anticipate I will largely uh, deal with, the foreign policy element, and a celebration of the industrial impact uh, of the large defence procurement policy uh, that this country is rolling out uh, at the time. And I suggest uh, celebrating uh, at the moment. My overall ask uh, from the Minister today uh, is for an overarching national carrier strategy uh, to deal with all of the aspects uh, that we will be uh, discussing during the course uh, of uh, the afternoon. Well, Mr Sharma, I'm going to uh, start off by placing myself on the uh, date uh, spectrum, as it were. Um, one of my earliest memories uh, is of uh, HMS Hermes uh, returning from the Falklands War. Uh, and I, I was very young at the time. Uh, and I very well remember that very large grey carrier uh, nosing slowly into Portsmouth Harbour, surrounded by many small ships welcoming it back, I was particularly struck by the fact that she was rusted and battered from having been at sea uh, for months on end. Uh, so battered, uh, but victorious at the end of that uh, unique campaign. I well remember uh, the white uniforms of the sailors uh, on, lined up in perfect formation on the deck and the noses of our little sea harriers, which had proved themselves to be an air defence system second to none in the freezing South Atlantic during 1982. But HMS Hermes was laid down during World War II as HMS Elephant. Uh, she was the last of the Centaur class of light fleet carriers. She entered service in 1957 uh, as an angle deck uh, carrier before converting to a commando helicopter carrier and then being adapted again with the ski jump to operate what was then the new sea harrier coming into service. But we haven't had large fleet carriers since the decommissioning of the audacious class HMS Eagle and HMS Ark Royal at the end of the 1970s. And it's the absence of the Royal Navy from the big carrier game that has been sorely missed by the Navy and the nation. And the Sea Harrier was unquestionably a brilliant aircraft, but it was limited in terms of range and in terms of payload, whilst the RAF's land-optimised Harrier was severely limited by its absence of an air-to-air -air radar, meaning it was never an adequate fleet air arm aircraft. And so whilst that Harrier Invincible class concept, the combination of those small carriers and the uh, vertical takeoff and landing jets, was a potent combination in the unique circumstances of the South Atlantic or in the North Atlantic as part of NATO groups hunting Russian submarines, um, there is no doubt that the inability to operate conventional fast jets and the nature of, of the Phantoms and the Buccaneers that we lost at the end of the 70s has severely restricted the power that Britain can exercise. And it's a loss that the country has mourned since then, with the result that governments of all colours have sought to restore that capability to us. Because the years have shown that although the end of empire has meant a smaller country, what it has not meant is a retreat from expeditionary warfare. Because we've seen almost every 10 years, at least, that Britain is involved in a capacity that means it requires expeditionary air power, often from sea. And the country's desire to, ex to, to express power, to express its values, <coughs> has not, Mr Sharma, at any stage over the course of the last 40 years been diminished. Now, in 1966, the country took the decision to run down the fixed-wing carrier fleet, part of a series, I don't want to make a part of a political point because all governments were part of it, a part of a series of extraordinarily inept defence decisions during that time, meaning that within 10 years, that decision was regretted. In a curiously British fudge, the three invincible class carriers, it always amuses me this, um, to get round the politics of why we weren't having aircraft any carriers anymore, only we were, were called through-deck cruisers. 
which strikes me as the most absurdly uh, daft um, political euphemism that we could imagine. And so whilst the ambition to return to the big carrier game is a long-standing one, the political chicanery around re-establishing a carrier capacity has meant that the concept, the philosophical, strategic idea of what big carriers are for, how they are to be used, with who, and under what circumstances, is something that's lacking, because the culture has, to a large extent, been lost, and that's something that we need to re-establish. And I suggest, Mr Sharma, that now is the time to do it, because what we have is a history where so much of carrier design has been British, be it the first carriers, like HMS Furious, uh, during the First World War, be it the angled flight deck that came in with the advent of fast jets at the end of the Second World War in the 1950s, or be it the ski jump in the 1980s. This was all British technology, British ideas leading the world, meaning that others had no alternative but to follow. And the same is true now. We are not the only people using the F-35B, but we are the only country in the world to be using the F-35B in combination with aircraft carriers that are designed from the keel up to use that aircraft. So we're in a position in which we are using the F-35. We're not the only people using the F-35. But I can say with total confidence that the aircraft carriers that we are using are better than anyone else's. Yeah. And so it must be the case that the return of Britain to that big carrier game must also be accompanied with a strategic philosophy about what carriers are about and how are they to be used. Now, for 20 years or so, it's been tacit, if not express, that Britain will probably not act alone in another military conflict, or at least not uh, in a major one. We will act with allies most likely with NATO, and hardly ever without the Americans offering support in one form or another. It is sadly inconceivable that we could undertake an operation like the Falklands again. In 1982, we had approximately 60 destroyers and frigates. That task force comprised 127 ships, consisting of 43 Royal Naval vessels, 22 from the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, and 62 merchant ships. At the end of the 1980s, the Royal Navy had two aircraft carriers, seven amphibious ships, 13 destroyers, and 35 frigates. After the 2010 SDR, that number had declined to approximately 19, where approximately it remains. In November 2018, there were 75 commissioned ships in the Royal Navy. 20 of those are major surface combatants, including six guided missile destroyers, Type 45s, which are air defense destroyers primarily, 13 frigates, and the new aircraft carrier. But let's look at what a modern carrier group demands of a modern navy so that we can match what we're asking with what we currently have available. And what I suggest is we need to think in an innovative fashion about how we are to address what we need and what we have. Now, no carrier strike group is a fixed body. It would depend for its composition upon the circumstances, upon what it was being asked to do, upon the allies it was operating with. But if we look at the US Navy, a typical US Navy carrier strike group would include the supercarrier, of course we would have a supercarrier, and the carrier air wing. The Americans would have one or two Aegis-guided missile cruisers of the Ticonderoga class, and a destroyer squadron which would have two or three guided missile destroyers of the Arleigh Burke class, which are roughly comparable to the Type 45s. I've used the word roughly. But that's a multi-mission surface combatant used primarily for air defence. And it's air defence and uh, undersurface uh, defence that I'm particularly concerned <coughs> with here. And they would have two attack submarines, which would be used to screen the carrier group against other submarines and against other surface combatants. Or if we look at the Italian, and of course support, uh, support ships, the Italians, uh, who also have a carrier battle group, would have the carrier, two destroyers, two support ships, and three amphibious support ships. But it's clearly something they may have to accept, that they have to expand or operate with allies in the event that they were to go into a near-peer environment. Now, Mr Sharma, this is not a lament for lost naval power, although 
I make no secret of the fact that as far as I'm concerned, we don't spend enough on defence. I feel that our armed forces are constantly being asked to do too much with too little. And I can't even start, for the purposes of this afternoon, on the pastoral aspects of armed forces funding, accommodation, paying conditions, and the overall offer, which is a serious issue for recruitment and retention. I don't even have time to start that. And I do accept, Mr Sharma, that the Minister, whatever he can say publicly, almost certainly <coughs> agrees with me. And I know that this is a plea that really I shouldn't be making to him, um, but to the Treasury. I do accept that. But what this is a plea for uh, is for a plea to the Ministry of Defence um, for serious strategic thought into how the carriers are likely to be used, with whom to ensure that we have sufficient mass and capability. Bluntly, to ensure that there is space for loss or damage to be sustained, either during a conflict or in the immediate aftermath. I, I will, once I've just made the point that if we don't do that, the reality is probably that we'll be unable to use the carriers at all. Putting forward, uh, there is a, a great need, in, in, and we recognise that, uh, that they, for the supply chain to be in place to, to repair, to, to build again. Uh, and, and I would like to see, uh, Mr Sharma, if it's at all possible, the benefits of that supply chain being spread across the whole of the United Kingdom. I know there's only specific places you can rebuild or repair, but nonetheless, there's a need for that supply chain to, to, to be representative of the four regions. Uh, does he feel that that supply chain is in place, number one, and does he feel that all the regions are getting the full benefit of it? I'm very grateful to the Honourable Member for making that point, which is excellent. I will refer to it in a little more detail shortly. I know some of my um, honourable friends uh, will also uh, address that point. Um, I'm keen to make, and I will in due course, make the point that the carriers, whilst they are big grey ships that live in Portsmouth, are not purely Portsmouth matters. They've been built by people, by constituents in all of our areas, by companies across the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, just in a moment, I will. Um, and that's sustained the building of the carriers, but we need to ensure that they can be maintained and kept in service for decades to come. And it's for this reason, exactly the reason the Honourable Member for Strangford has made, that I'm asking the Minister to consider a strategy, because this needs to be a whole government approach. It's no good us just looking at this as purely a Ministry of Defence, and I'm conscious I'm asking the Minister to do more than's in his power, but it has to be a cross-government approach. We have to look at Bayes. So we can see whether we have the industrial base to ensure that the supply chain which built the carriers remains in place to sustain and maintain them in the years ahead. His point is absolutely on the point that I wish to make. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I'd like to thank my honourable friend for giving way and congratulate him on secure this debate. He's making a brilliant, brilliant speech. I'm just thinking about the point he made earlier about the improbability or the unlikeliness of us, of us using the carrier fleet to act unilaterally. Whilst it might be difficult to see those circumstances, you can't rule them out, and there may be a time when we will have to act unilaterally, possibly on a smaller scale than the Falklands conflict. But it's also not strictly easy to make a comparison between a carrier fleet today with what we sent to the Falklands. The capabilities are infinitely greater, even if it's smaller in size. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Member, who must have read my speech in advance <laughs> of making his intervention, because it's exactly that point. If you'll forgive me. I'm going to go on and make exactly that point now. So rather than respond directly to his intervention, I'll just go on and address the next part of my speech. So in the Falklands, as I've said, we had approximately 60 destroyers and frigates as escorts. Of those, eight destroyers and 15 frigates were part of the task force. Uh, four of those were lost and many more damaged, some very seriously in the course of that conflict. And of course, you can see the initial concern that any similar level today would destroy about a third of the Royal Navy's air defence fleet, um, which would be unsustainable. And of course, you need more than the minimum deployed in case uh, such damage does take place. Now, I appreciate, as the Honourable Member makes, that history never repeats itself exactly. I entirely accept that the Falklands Task Force was a one-off, probably unique um, uh, event, um, and that you would need many more ships available if you're looking to support an invasion force, as, for example, we were then, particularly when we were operating at the other end of the world, a long way away from supply chains. I entirely accept that, so the, par the, uh, the parallels are not precise. It's also true 
that the Type 45s are vastly more capable than the Type 42s that they replace. I accept that in its entirety. Um, it's also true that they are the best in the world as air defence destroyers. They essentially combine the Ticonderoga and Arleigh Burke mission platforms into one. They're better than each of them on a platform-to-platform -platform basis. Um, but I would suggest that it isn't always the case that you can do the job with fewer, simply because the Type 45s, 42s were the cutting-edge destroyers of their day. And as soon as the Falklands War started, we found that their weaknesses were ruthlessly exposed, particularly with regards to survivability of damage, uh, as was so horrifyingly uh, exposed, particularly in the case of HMS Sheffield. I simply suggest that there does come a point when we do need mass. And whilst I want us to be able to act unilaterally, I don't disagree with the Honourable Member in at all, we do need to consider the possibility that in most cases we won't be, and I just simply am asking the government to consider the strategy of how that would take place. I am very reluctant, instinctively, to follow a line of argument that says that because a single platform is more capable than that it replaced, that you can do away with less. And I say that simply because all of these high-tech platforms, and it's true across the whole of military capability, can turn out to be horribly vulnerable in ways you don't expect. Let's think of the USS Cole incident, speedboat packed with explosives. Let's think about small drones which are cheaply, easily available on the internet, packed full of explosives in a swarm capability such that they overwhelm even the most potent defensive systems. Let's think about some of the carrier killer missiles that we know are being uh, developed by some potential adversaries. And you can see where the threats already are. So I simply say no more than this. Whilst I accept the parallels aren't precise, and I accept that the capability is streets ahead of what we saw when I was a child, that there does come a point when we need mass, and we need to think about how we're going to provide that, given the finances um, that we have. Mr. Sharma, I have to say, the Honourable Gentleman's making an outstanding contribution here that I, I can't stop listening to, and I pay tribute to him. Um, there's another basi basis, is there not, um, for uh, mass and numbers as well as capability, and that is that we have commitments, including commitments to our allies, Absolutely. spread around the, around the globe. And it doesn't matter how good a platform is, is it not the case that in order to maintain those commitments, we also need numbers? Yeah. Uh, well, I was absolutely right, and I could not agree more with his, uh, the point that he's made. And when you look at the ratio of the amount of ships that we had available in 1982 against the amount that were deployed in the task force, you can see that the Navy then was very highly tasked as it was, and there has been no downscaling in the amount of commitments that we actually practically have. Now, I know the government is addressing this in many ways, and I entirely applaud the Type 31E concept, which means we can try to rebuild mass with a smaller, perhaps cheaper, modular type of ship that we can export, and we can perhaps have some platforms around so that if you're dealing with anti-piracy operations, you don't need a cutting-edge Type 45. You can, you can have a smaller Corvette-type frigate. I entirely agree with that. But his essential point is absolutely right, that there comes a point when mass is needed because no ship, however good it is, can be in more than one place at any one time. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Yes, I mean, I think simply my point is that countermeasures are being developed to all of the uh, threats that I have mentioned, to drones, to speedboats. Uh, but, uh, as von Moltke said, no plan survives contact with the enemy. Uh, it's equally the case, as I've referred to in the case of the Type 42, that no platform's wartime capability ever quite matches up to its paper peacetime capability because no war ever takes place if the other guy doesn't think he also has a chance. And as much as we think... Our platforms are great. They're looking at ways in which they can undermine them. And they only have to be right one time out of uh, 100. And they'll cause us damage. So there is a time when mass uh, is required. Now, I know the government is thinking along these lines already. And I welcome the announcement um, that from October that the Royal Netherlands Navy will be sending a warship to be part of the carrier battle group for the first operational tour, which um, is part, an important part of the strand uh, of thinking that this warship will form part um, of a combined uh, NATO uh, battle group. But I would suggest that a broader strategy is required in order to involve other allies, because it's easily foreseeable that a time may come along, as with France, very close ally, um, in 2003, who decided that France did not wish to be part um, of uh, the action that we were undertaking uh, at the time. 
allies may not wish to take part in all operations, and that's perfectly understandable. But that should not mean that the UK's carrier group is unable to put to sea because a certain ally uh, does not wish to take part. So the MOD has refused to be drawn thus far on exactly what vessels would deploy. Um, but it's part of my ask for a strategy that this thinking is fleshed out to ensure that we can go to sea in all circumstances in terms of numbers, capacity and national partners to ensure that we address all different possibilities. And these possibilities must also include potential operations. I've tended to think about this because it's a big carrier, it's a fleet carrier, it's a return to the big carrier concept um, that we've lost in the past, of thinking about fleet carrier and carrier strike operations. But I know the government is thinking about the utilisation of the carrier in the literal uh, role. And that will mean that we have different uh, troops on board, different uh, machines on board, and the support vessels required uh, will also be different uh, as well. And yeah, I will. The third point I will make sure I do give way to him uh, is that in 1982 we had sufficient mass, coming back to Honourable Member uh, Chester's point, that you could work it up over a weekend. I mean, the task force was put together over a weekend and went to sea. That's not likely to be possible anymore because we just simply don't have the mass and the numbers. So we have to think about in advance about how we'll do that for each potential likely scenario. Well, the Honourable Member has given an excellent comprehensive speech. Um, you will note the, the issue of the carriers being used in the literal role, which they aren't designed for. Does he lament the decommissioning without replacement of HMS Ocean? And note the excellent work that Intrepid and Fearless did in that role during the South Atlantic conflict. Yeah. It's an excellent point uh, that he makes. Um, I, uh, we have had an announcement recently um, from the Secretary of State with regards to... Uh, ships that will take on at least some of the capabilities of HMS Ocean uh, with the commercial vessels refitted um, to take uh, helicopters uh, in the literal role. Um, but, I mean, essentially, yes, I do mourn uh, the loss of HMS Ocean, although I do note that she was requiring heavy refit at the time and there was an economic case uh, around that. But the, es the essence of his point in terms of a proper literal um, capability with a platform designed for it, um, I couldn't agree uh, with more. And it is true um, that the carriers, whilst they'll have a literal role, isn't something that they're really designed for. And it strikes me that we will be keeping them as far out to sea as possible if we're in any kind of near peer uh, environment. So without that strategic thought and overarching strategy that I urge, we risk being faced with a wonderful carrier capability that simply cannot be used without running an unacceptable risk to the carriers or to the Royal Navy's overall capa uh, capability. Uh, anyone who's read um, General Sheriff's novel, War with Russia, I don't know whether many honourable members have, um, but it's, um, it's, it's worth reading. Uh, General Sheriff um, describes a British Prime Minister desperate to make a strong political gesture sending the new Queen Elizabeth carrier to sea without an adequate escort with the response that a ruthless Russian regime which had been listening for months to the carrier's precise acoustic signature as we can guarantee all our adversaries potential adversaries in the world will be doing at this very moment uh, sends her to sea without an adequate uh, cover with the result that she's sent uh, to the bottom the book is meant as a warning and I simply suggest it's a warning that we all should be taking uh, seriously I'm not just talking about Royal Naval ships. I'll try and speed up a little bit because I know there's others who wish to speak. The biggest change in British maritime strength post Falklands lies in the drastic uh, reduction of merchant vessels sailing under the British flag. In 1982, approximately half of the task force um, was uh, requisitioned, which was Royal Navy uh, Merchant Reserve. Uh, these days, for such a capacity, or I accept, as the Honourable Member says, that, that may not be what we're doing, the government would look to having to charter foreign vessels with everything um, that that would mean. Again, it's part of the strategy. It's something I suggest that we should be looking at uh, now. That's merely talking about escort warships, as I've spent most of my comments. I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking uh, about the aircraft. Um, each carrier can have up to 36 uh, embarked, and we're expecting a first squadron of 12 for an initial operating capacity and um, capability to be ready um, shortly with two by 2023. And I welcome the Secretary of State's announcement on the 11th of February that the US Marines F-35s, F-35Bs will be ready for the carrier's first deployment cruise. This is good news. 
not just because it means that the carrier will be operational sooner than it otherwise would have been, um, but because it seems to me that it provides a template for the sort of operation that we may be looking at for the future, of embedded close cooperation with allies to achieve our common military aims. But as central as our relationship with the Americans is and always should be to our defence and to NATO, I would suggest um, that we look further. Italy, Japan and Turkey, all of whom are scheduled to operate the F-35B, all of them are potential, I know the decision hasn't been made, but potential partners for Team Tempest, the next generation replacement for the Typhoon. So if we're looking at cooperating on one program, it seems to me a good idea that we should think about, as part of an overarching strategy, operating with other international partners um, in terms of carrier air groups. Italy, as I've already noted, has her own uh, carrier uh, air group. In terms of equipment, uh, we've talked just already about um, the uh, literal role, um, and I'm delighted that uh, the Crow's Nest platform, uh, just before I get on to literal, the Crow's Nest platform to provide airborne early warning is being brought forward. Ever since the lack of one in the Falklands, um, it's been quite clear that there simply must be a carrier-borne organic airborne early warning uh, capability. But let's think about stores and supplies. We talked about the literal role. Um, it's likely, I suspect, that carriers will be kept out at sea simply for reasons of reducing their vulnerability, in which case the lift capability would be required by helicopters, which have limited range, payload, speed, uh, and load carrying capacity, or we're looking at ship-to-ship -ship transfers at sea. I would merely observe that the V-22 Osprey, which is used by the US Marines and Navy, yes, it's very expensive, it's also been built to hold an F-35 engine and can do so with speed, lift and range that isn't something we currently have the capability to do. Uh, and I note that Lord West in the other place has made the same suggestion and it's something that I consider, Mr Sharma, we should be considering. So since 2010, as a country, we've turned our back on the need for close air support operating from and within a naval task group. That's being put right, and I wholeheartedly uh, welcome it. But we do need to ensure that we don't replace that issue with having a very strong core operating capacity, but without the support in terms of ships and supplies to sustain it. Before I uh, let others uh, have, uh, have their say, I'd like to make two other brief um, comments, which is firstly about foreign policy. Uh, and secondly, about uh, industry. The Honourable Member for Strangford, who's uh, not in his place now, has, has alluded to earlier on in the speech. There's been much talk recently, uh, Mr Sharma, of a global Britain. And I don't see this personally as being a reaction to Brexit or an attempt to find a role, but simply a reassertion of a natural British desire to act globally. We've always been, uh, as an island nation, one with very broad horizons. Much of the brilliance of our island history is because of the way in which we have explored, found new cultures, adopted, adapted, assimilated, exported the best of our values and adopted the best of that we've met elsewhere. And of course the sacrifice of this country in defending freedom through two world wars and defending democracy needs no explanation here. So Britain's always been a global nation and I suggest Mr Sharma that we should see these carriers within that tradition. We should see the ability to project world-leading global air power around the world as the opportunity to act as a force for good, to defend democracy, human rights, to defend the weak and downtrodden. And so clearly there's a major foreign policy aspect that should be considered in partnership with the defence uh, agenda that I've laid out. And I would ask that strategy to be adopted across government, with the Foreign Office, as well as Defence, uh, as well uh, as Bayes. And I welcome the announcement that a deployment to the Pacific will be part of the first Queen Elizabeth deployment, and I would suggest that a combined Defence and Foreign Office um, strategy is worked up to address the circumstances of that. And I don't mean purely for warfare. Never let us forget the prestige of the Royal Navy, its soft power, and by reflection, that of Britain itself is enormous. It demonstrates the very best of British skill and professionalism. And I'm delighted to see from my time on the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme, I'm on the Navy Scheme this year, um, that the Royal Navy is once again utilising its enormous prestige 
to bring together parties abroad who wouldn't necessarily be able to come together in a diplomatic capacity. How much more could be done with world-beating carrier capability as a showcase for British industrial and military prowess? So let's see a tie-up as well with the Foreign Office, with DFID, and with the Department for International Trade. And my last few remarks were about industry. And this is very much a celebration, uh, Mr. Sharma. As I've said, these are not just big grey naval ships that are a benefit to the people of Portsmouth, although they unquestionably are. They're also a benefit to the whole of the United Kingdom because they've been built by all of our constituents in companies all across uh, the country. UK industry is set to benefit from a 15% build share of the jets, £13 billion to British companies. And UK shipbuilding employs 23,000 people and contributes £1.7 billion a year to the UK economy. Mr Sharma, we are lucky to see, coming into service, the finest ships of their type anywhere in the world, crewed by the most professional navy. Together, they are bringing together the glory of the Royal Navy's history with the technological industrial prowess that is our hallmark for the future. These carriers can help us unite new friends around the world in times of peace and defend freedom in time of war. They are the very best of our country, and I wholeheartedly celebrate them, and I hope we all can. The question is that this House has considered carrier strike strategy and its contribution to UK defence. Ruth Smith. Thank you very much, Mr Sharma. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I just want to uh, correct my friend and colleague, the member for Whitney, and say that women serve on, will be serving on the yeah. aircraft carrier yeah. too, not just men. Um, I will give way. <laughs> Sense of humanity, of course I meant men and women, I'm sorry. <laughs> and now moving on, um, may I um, alert the House to my members' interests and also the fact that I am the uh, Vice Chair of the APPG for the Armed Forces and the lead on the Royal Navy, something I'm incredibly proud as a woman to be doing. You're going to get some grief today, my friend. Um, I'd like to just touch briefly on some of the issues that have already been addressed but from my own perspective. Mr Sharma, the Queen Elizabeth class is exquisite. They are beautiful ships, and they will be a wonderful addition to our Royal Navy, as long as we can ensure that we have enough um, crew to staff them. Yeah. I'm not even going to say man them now. Um, <laughs> but, it, but the people who will be, on, will be serving on these platforms whilst incredibly important and we do have current recruitment challenges for them, it is not them I wish to touch on today, but rather the wider military family. Because in my opinion, the people that make the platforms are as important for our national security as the people who serve on them. Our national security um, uh, capabilities and our capacity to continue to be a tier one military country are dependent on the fact that we have a wider military industrial complex in order to build our capabilities. When I have visited Rosyth, Rosyth Shipyard and other of our defence establishments, I'm always struck not just by their professionalism but by their dedication. The Minister knows that every time we, we meet with the people who are building them, they build them because they know that their friends and family may well be serving on them. It is important for them that they know that they are doing the perfect job to ensure that in the future our service personnel have the best possible platforms afforded to them and the best in the world for the Royal Navy. The Queen Elizabeth class is extraordinary. Six, it was an engineering feat. Six shipyards, 11,000 people touched pieces of metal to build these extraordinary capabilities. £6.2 billion of capacity and equipment for a platform. And that's before you touch on either the F-35s that will be on the platform or even, as the MP for the Potter is, 
the tableware that our service personnel will be eating off. And I'm sure that the minister will reassure me that it's being purchased from the potteries. Assure me, not. <laughs> Please, minister. Um, my challenge, and, but I th I'd like to look at the aircraft carrier in the widest possible context, however, because I think it demonstrates the challenges that we have in the sector, both in terms of procurement for the aircraft carrier, but also longer term in securing the carrier strike group. It is over, it's 12 years since this former Secretary of State finally signed off the paperwork for the aircraft carrier. 2007, the former Secretary of State um, launched, finally launched the programme to start the process of building the carrier. Flight trials are happening this year. Even from the moment that we agree to build, it has taken 12 years to get to this point. That is, and there were 10 years, there was a decade prior to that where we debated, designed, determined what the concept should be of our future aircraft carrier. This challenged our shipyards. It challenged whether we'd have the resources available, whether we had the skill set, the domestic sovereign capability in order to build the platform. During the lifespan of the Queen Elizabeth class, we will have to replace the astute programme. We will have to update and replace the Type 45. We would have seen the end of the Type 23 and the replacement with the Type 26. And we will be talking about the Type 26's replacement, all in the lifetime of this capability. And we may even, by that point, have seen one Type 31E. Um, it requires a long-term plan for procurement in order just to ensure that we have the strike group capability for Queen Elizabeth class. So my urge, my demand, my request of the lovely minister is that we need to look longer term. We need to consider the steady drumbeat of orders so that the industry, so our domestic industry will be able to deliver the capabilities that we require in the long term. And I say to the minister that even at this point, we're still not sure of how many fleet solid support ships we're actually going to get when we really probably could do with three. So for me, I make a call that we recognise not just how fabulous these platforms are going to be, not just the requirements and their usage, both from a military, but also from a diplomatic and soft power perspective, but that we remember that the people who have made them that our constituents from up and down the country, that our constituents near my own constituency, which couldn't be more landlocked, we make, um, we help contribute to the astute class and dreadnought class, that actually this is a national program with national consequences, with a national contribution to our GDP. So I urge the minister to give me my steady drumbeat of orders going forward. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And Mary Trevlin. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharma, and it's an honour to be able to speak in this debate, and, it's, and I'd like to put on record an enormous honour to follow uh, the Honourable Member for Stoke on Trent North, uh, a woman whose resilience and extraordinary tenacity in the face of personal challenges at the moment uh, in her political life um, deserves all our support and respect, and I know she certainly has it from those of us in the room today. Um, if we can have... <laughs> yes, of course I will. I just, uh, do, I hope you allow me, Mr. Sharma. What a really decent thing for the honourable member just to have done. And can we all associate ourselves publicly with what she's just said about my honourable friend? Oh, I thank um, the honourable gentleman for his kind words. And I don't think it's any hardship. And I think all of us uh, who believe in what this house uh, stands for. Um, would commend her for her extraordinary resilience. And I would commend to the Minister that every member of our armed forces were as resilient and tough and determined alongside Charming as she is. I think we would yeah. be able to take on the world without any trouble at all. <laughs> anyway, I shall return to the matter of hand, which is a ship which I am particularly proud of. But, Mr Sharma, the United Kingdom is a maritime nation, a coastal state, with over 90% of our trade and goods flowing into and out of its ports on domestic and global sea lanes. Our trade flows remain entirely dependent on ensuring that home waters and those international waters are kept open and that they are safe for commercial sea traffic. 
This is the 80th anniversary year of the start of the Battle of the Atlantic, the longest battle in the history of naval warfare. It reminds me that at its heart, what was then the critical point remains so now. It is our Royal Navy's primary responsibility to keep the high seas safe for the free flow of our trade in goods, in energy and in food. And they can only do so if they have the best and world-leading equipment and weaponry and always the advantage over potential enemies. As an island nation, the United Kingdom was highly dependent on imported goods, even in 1939. Britain required more than a million tonnes of imported material every week in order to be able to survive, to feed our populations, albeit on rations, and to fight. In essence, the Battle of the Atlantic was a tonnage war. The Allied struggle to supply Britain and the Axis attempt to stem the flow of merchant shipping that enabled Britain to keep fighting. From 1942, the Axis also sought to prevent the build-up of Allied supplies and equipment into the British Isles in preparation for the invasion of occupied Europe. The outcome of the battle was a strategic victory for the Allies. The German blockade failed, but at great cost. The Battle of the Atlantic has been called the longest, largest and most complex naval battle in history. But at its essence was that critical message, which we have perhaps become a little lazy about. We are an island, and unless we choose policies to make us entirely self-sufficient, which would of course limit our choices dramatically, we must always invest in our Royal Navy to keep our sea lanes open. As Brexit approaches and our view of ourselves as a maritime nation once again comes to the fore, there could not be a more timely moment to be discussing and calling on government to put into place a clear whole-of-government strategy for our aircraft carriers and the carrier strike group of ships which will sail the seas and oceans across the globe with HMS Queen Elizabeth or HMS Prince of Wales in order to keep those flows of goods to and from the United Kingdom's shores as certain as possible. Mr. Sharma, we're introducing these two new aircraft carriers into service with the Royal Navy. The first, HMS Queen Elizabeth, is already working her way up to full service. The second, Prince of Wales, is following closely behind. I'd like to tell you a little more, if I may, Mr. Sharma, about these two extraordinary feats of British industrial design, construction, skill and innovation. I've had the honour to watch them grow from boxes of steel made in shipyards across our country and put together in Ross Ith, with engineering so sophisticated that the margin of error was millimetres only on these vast steel structures. These ships have grown into their present form under the watchful eye of highly skilled shipyard workers in Ross Ith, with a unique partnering relationship of industry and the MOD with the Royal Navy. The Aircraft Carrier Alliance was a first of its kind as a procurement project, the end user genuinely involved throughout the process to maximise both value for money for the taxpayer, but the most user-friendly vessel for the Royal Navy to live and work aboard. We now have in HMS Queen Elizabeth the most sophisticated and comprehensive carrier capability in the world. And her sister ship, HMS Prince of Wales, will be coming into service close behind her. The increasing speed of build demonstrated with the second vessel proves so well why ship classes get better and more finely tuned as more are built. But perhaps it is not surprising that the Treasury decided that two was enough at £3 billion each and a crew requirement of 800 or more sailors. We are at an all-time low in manpower terms for the Royal Navy and all these factors are important. Mind you, £3 billion for a 50-year lifespan investment strikes me, even as the critical friend to the MOD I am sitting on the Public Accounts Committee, as a pretty good investment return, considering the choices the carrier group can offer governments and NATO. It is to be hoped that in the months ahead, as the Modernising Defence Review progresses and real changes in the business model take place within the department, that the imbalance in funding between the three services' top-level budgets since the 2010 SDSR will be sorted out so that the Royal Navy can meet its activity requirements, which my honourable friend raised earlier, and be able to increase its output after nine years of trying to meet requirements and the challenges of the continuous at sea deterrent commitment without ever quite enough funding. We want to be able to maximise those outputs. That's time at sea, if it's in the Royal Navy, so that our sailors and our ships are out there doing what we ask them to do. So unlike the French, who only have the Charles de Gaulle aircraft carrier, the beauty of having two of these great ships is that we can ensure that we have this capability at sea 365 days a year. And I hope the Minister will reassure the House today that rumours emanating from Treasury sources that it might be fine to mothball or indeed sell Prince of Wales are unfounded. We need two ships to provide 365 days input. 
Now, I could talk about the Queen Elizabeth class military capability in more detail, Mr Chairman, but I think it's safe to say that my colleagues are all over that already. Um, but I have had the privilege to visit these ships in construction, watch Queen Elizabeth leave Rosyth on her maiden voyage. It was a real hold-your-breath moment because she had to squeeze under the bridge with her hinge radar lowered to get out into the open seas on the lowest tides in the summer of 2017. I then had the even greater privilege of being aboard this mighty vessel on the 8th of December 2017 when she was formally commissioned into the Royal Navy and her ensign changed from blue to white. The Queen and I, and a few others, uh, were inside this enormous hangar as the Princess Royal took on the weather on deck to perform the formal ceremony. Amidst all the pomp and circumstance, the real honour of hearing my monarch speak of her own naval life, her words as the daughter, wife and mother of her family who had all served in the Royal Navy. I looked at the young sailors, some looked very young indeed, that may be a reflection on me, uh, young men and women standing to attention before their commander-in-chief. These young sailors were simply brimming with excitement and pride at their opportunity to be the first sailors to serve on a ship which will be in service for 50 years or more, a ship which will be the cornerstone of our UK defence and military posture for decades to come, both at home and across the globe, a ship whose last commanding officer has not yet been born. So, Mr Sharma, why do these state-of-the-art aircraft carriers make even the US Navy jealous? Well, for anyone who knows my interests, they will know my enduring respect for those in our silent service who have, for the last 50 years, served on our continuous at sea deterrent under the waves. Our submarine service has been deployed 24-7, 365 days a year since April 1969, no pomp or circumstance, just the silent, invisible defence of our citizens, NATO allies, and our interests, bearing the unimaginable responsibility of holding our greatest weapon of peace, the Trident missile, at readiness in case it is ever needed. The aircraft carrier, Mr Sharma, is the surface equivalent. Our carriers will, between them, provide our surface at sea continuous deterrent, if that makes sense, in the conventional sense. With their fighter jets aboard and the strike group of ships with them, they will provide the most effective defence capability for the United Kingdom and our allies. But crucially, both in home waters and in maritime theatres of operation around the globe, HMS Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales will also be able to operate offensive capability, as determined by our government, either alone, but most likely in concert with NATO and other allies. As with CASD, our nuclear deterrent carried on submarines the carrier is a national asset whose deployment will be determined and informed by political and diplomatic priorities. It is interesting that in some of the narratives today about the questioning of our carriers and why we've bothered to invest in them, issues like vulnerability and purpose are raised. But if the carrier group model is questioned, why is it that the Chinese are building aircraft carriers as quickly as they can? Why is it that the Americans are so keen to work with us and our carrier groups in the years ahead? Quite simply, Mr. Sharma, because this is a powerful and effective tool. Critically, though, these are not ships to be mothballed and only to be put to sea when needed for naval warfare, as some of our illustrious naval ships of old were. And, if I may, just because I love ships' names and I think we should take a moment to consider them, but also the men who served and indeed many who died in them, early aircraft carriers in the Royal Navy have included, in the First World War, HMS Furious, Argus and Hermes, in the 1920s, we saw HMS Courageous and Glorious. In the 30s, HMS Illustrious, Ark Royal and Formidable. And through the Second World War, HMS Indefatigable, Indomitable, Unicorn, Colossus, Edgar, Audacious, Ocean, Vengeance, Mars, Venerable, Warrior, Theseus, Triumph, Majestic, Terrible and Magnificent. Powerful names for powerful war-fighting machines. Floating air bases from which to command battle space since World War I and the creation of air power. But nothing like our latest carriers. The 21st century aircraft carrier is not only a warfighter, the only dedicated fifth-generation platform in the world equipped and designed to deliver the F-35B fighter jet but she can serve in any number of roles, supporting and promoting our national interests. As we leave the EU and look to stand tall on the global stage once again as a sovereign nation, these platforms can provide a range of opportunities for diplomacy, intelligence gathering, trade, humanitarian support and disaster relief. 
And this is really why we've called this debate today, Mr. Sharma, because it's vital that if we are to make our stated aims of becoming once again a global-facing Britain, reaching out to old friends and new in trade and alliances, we must make full use of these extraordinary ships. These carriers are diplomatic tools for our country, the Royal Yacht Britannia of the 21st century, perhaps, able to deliver a diplomatic message, hard or soft, to assist with trade delegations, as indeed HMS Queen Elizabeth has already done in New York last autumn, and providing humanitarian relief on a scale never before seen by the UK, if needed, anywhere in the world. Mr Sharma, government PR and official statements to date about these carriers of ours have been focused on size, on tonnage, on capability, and all of those are impressive. But the important conversation which we need to have with the UK citizen needs to be about much more than those good stories about skills, jobs, next generation ships. As these great ships cruise our vast oceans, they will be a hub for intelligence collection and dissemination to assist all our allies in keeping our world as safe as possible. These platforms are the epitome of the vision created by our National Security Advisor, Sir Mark Sedwell, the fusion doctrine, properly joining up all the strands of defensive, offensive and humanitarian activity ordered and put into effect by government. These great ships of ours, Mr Sharma, are the epitome of fusion afloat. The aircraft carrier in its carrier strike group from whichever nation is operated by navies, but it's programmed by prime ministers and presidents. The President of the United States receives a daily brief of the whereabouts of the US Navy carrier battle groups. The French President authorises the deployment intentions of the Charles de Gaulle personally. Leaders visit their carriers as part of their demonstration of national pride and, of course, of power. We have restored to our naval capabilities two great ships and the opportunity to create carrier strike groups with huge reach for the next 50 years. They are the cornerstone of a naval task force to project UK power and influence in many ways in the decades ahead, in the way we have been unable to for several decades. So I look forward to hearing from the Minister on how government is making progress across those departmental silos, which everybody knows drive me crackers, to build an effective and coherent strategy for our state-of-the-art latest in a great historic line of British aircraft carriers. This is a great opportunity, and I urge the government to take full advantage of what a constantly at-sea carrier strike group can offer global security and British power projection. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Sharma. It's a, a great pleasure to, to speak in this debate called by the Honourable Member Whitney, who's made a very excellent introduction. I think he set out the, the history of carrier strike capability in the UK with aplomb and uh, really spoke highly of our capability and the opportunity in the future, which was fantastic. Um, I share the sentiments a moral friend, the member for Stoke on Trent North, who raised the industrial capability issues. Um, and I, I speak with, with some degree of interest in that because I think I'm the only member in this house who was actually involved in the design and construction of the Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers in, in Glasgow. Um, and one of the most striking uh, aspects of being involved with the project was when I first started um, as a graduate at BE Systems and the chief engineer gave us a briefing about the Queen Elizabeth class and he was talking about the complexity of the project. And the one thing he really did to, to strike at home to us was he put up an image of the, um, an aerial photograph of RAF Lossiemouth. And he said, um, you're looking at uh, 5.6 million square metres of, of real estate there. And that's what we have to now. We have to take the same amount of traffic of aircraft movements and condense it into 0.3% of the space. Uh, and that's how we deliver the Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carrier. So that just shows you how complex the delivery of an aircraft carrier is because you're essentially taking an airfield and compacting it into 0.3% of the space and trying to deliver the same intensity of operations at sea in all weather conditions. So that's really, in a nutshell, why an aircraft carrier is such a complex project and is probably um, amongst the, the, the top five most complex engineering projects ever undertaken by the, the mankind. Um, and it's a great testament to British engineering that we have been able to achieve this capability um, despite the challenges faced by um, inconsistent construction runs and, and, and feast and famine orders that have plagued our shipbuilding industry for decades. And I think that's what my honourable friend, the member for Stoke and Trent North, was hinting at. That, and also, actually, the member for Whitney as well. He talked about the bad decisions that were made in the 1960s. Um, for example, the cancellation of the CVA-01 aircraft carrier project 
which was uh, intended to be called HMS Prince of Wales and Queen Elizabeth. We got there only 40 years later. But um, also the cancellation of the TSR to um, strategic bomber um, at that time as well. Um, and it seems like history has a habit of repeating itself. I lament the, the very poor decisions that were made in the 2010 Strategic uh, Defence and Security Review, which destroyed the Nimrod maritime patrol aircraft, which are now recognised um, as, a, as a failure of judgment and we're trying to replicate, but with the loss of British sovereign capability to build large fixed-wing uh, aircraft like the Nimrod. Um, also um, looking at the failure to sort of adapt our shipbuilding capabilities for the long term as well. I, I do fear that the uh, national shipbuilding strategy does have a series of flaws in it and we have to be aware of what those flaws are because what happened with the construction of the aircraft carrier was a, a real difficulty to get match fit again to deal with the scale of that project. Um, and that was largely what I was concerned with in, in Govan. I've got a photograph, actually, um, of me standing in bay one of the ship block and outfit hall at Govan as lower block four is transferred out of that hall um, and onto a barge um, to be taken to Resyth. But the size and the beam of the aircraft carrier was actually dictated by the fact that it was a shipyard built by a Norwegian company to build gas tankers in the late 1980s and 1990s. That's the, the, the width of the aircraft carrier was determined by how big this hall was that was built. So we were building it in a shipyard that was never ever designed or constructed to build an aircraft carrier. So the whole, the whole structure of the aircraft carrier was designed around the industrial limitations we had. And it feels to me that we haven't learned that, that the, the mistakes that were made and the constraints that were imposed by it in the industry um, in building this project. And that's why we haven't really looked at how the national shipbuilding strategy is getting us to upper quartile performance in world shipbuilding. And that's something that is a glaring omission from that document. And I hope that the work of the all-party parliamentary group for shipbuilding and ship repair that is bringing forward a review of the national shipbuilding strategy in the next few weeks will hopefully offer constructive um, and positive uh, suggestions as to how we can improve that strategy. It's critical that we get that right. Um, looking at the threat to the shipbuilding industry, we've already seen that in Glasgow, certainly, 2,723 people are supported on a full-time equivalent basis by the shipbuilding industry, um, and it supports an additional 3,000 220 jobs in Scotland um, and that speaks to the scale of the whole aircraft carrier project which supported not just um, 8,000 shipyard workers in eight shipyards, so that's a slight correction and if you include Scotland and Govan as separate distinct shipyards <laughs> there, 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 there's eight, eight, don't never confuse Govan and Scotland as one shipyard uh, it's, a, it's a fatal error in Glasgow <laughs> um, but, to give way. Happy to give way <laughs> I thank the Honourable Member and my friend for giving way I think actually he may want to raise this issue with the Minister because that's the data available on the Royal Navy oh, website right. Well, I, 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 I must, must correct the Minister of Defence. As a fair, a fairly indignant, and Glaswegians will be coming banging on your door. But um, the issue, the issue goes back to the, 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 the drumbeat of orders and stability in the order book. Because I used to sit um, with colleagues in the shipyard, and we'd look at resource planning, and we'd plug in different projects, and we'd see the curve of labour demand over the next 10, 15 years. And we knew that at a certain point, redundancies would have to be made, or contractions would have to, have to be made, because the loading of the shipyard's work program was not smoothed. And that is because of a failure of proper coordinated planning between the Ministry of Defence, the Treasury in terms of financing projects, and industry to make sure that we've got as stable and smooth a curve as possible, which then delivers learning curve benefits, industrial efficiency, and also the confidence to invest in world-class infrastructure and processes that creates a virtuous cycle that delivers world-class competitive edge that then means we can sell ships around the world competitively priced um, and deliver a sustainable and growing shipbuilding industry. If we can get that equation properly correct and, and, and optimised, then we're in a good place. But I fear that the national shipbuilding strategy isn't going to address that. And one of the symptoms of it is, I have to say, the Type 31E. Um, it's a laudable aspiration. But the reality is we are committing the same mistake again and again and again of going to year zero and designing and building a new platform from scratch every time. It's a total failure of understanding of how this works in industry. The Americans have been building the Arleigh Burke class for the last 30 years with incremental improvements to the same platform. We need to get onto that sort of concept and we need to work to that sort of concept. There's no reason why we can't adapt the Type 45 hull for a number of different uses and there's no reason why we can't adapt the Type 26 hull for a number of different uses. Actually, building the ship as a raw steel box, if you like, is only about 8% of the overall capital cost. It's about how you spec it and how you fit it out that drives the cost into the platform. So if we can just get a standardized basic ship type 
for each type of ship needed for the Royal Navy. That's how we drive efficiency into the programmes and get more hulls into the water and build a rigorous carrier strike battle group around the Queen Elizabeth class that will allow us to get the bulk back into the Royal Navy. Having spoken to the Royal Navy, they've said they've got 19 escorts just now. They need 24 to meet all their current planning needs. So the Navy needs to meet that gap. Um, how are we going to do it? No definition of how that's happening. I would say we need 24 plus more um, to meet that. We used to have 32 escorts as recently as 20 years ago. How do we get back to that situation? I don't think Type 31 is going to solve that problem. Um, so how do we fix that issue? Because it's not just about looking at the aircraft carriers, which are a, a fantastic ship uh, and class of ship in isolation. It's about how we build that resilience into the carrier strike battle group. And if we don't get the escort proposition correct and efficient, then we're not going to meet that need. And that's why it goes back to getting our industrial capability correct. And that's not been addressed by the National Shipbuilding Strategy. And another symptom of that problem is the fleet solid support ships competition. Absolutely insane, if you ask me, to be even entertaining an international competition for this because it belies any understanding of how to drive value into the project. So looking at the fleet solid support ship, 6,700 jobs created are secured, including 1,800 shipyard jobs, including 450 apprentices, and indeed £272 million recycled back into the UK economy through wage and supplier payments to the Treasury. Those figures must be weighted in the judgment for the UK bid on fleet solid support ships, and it must be weighted into the need to sustain the critical mass of industrial capability that the, the aircraft carrier project left as a legacy at Resyth, where we're looking at over a thousand job losses potentially in the next few years um, across the Babcock Group and shipbuilding, the closure of Appledore, which built the bulbous bows for the aircraft carrier. Um, there's huge industrial capabilities that are at risk. I mean, we've just seen the the rugby site which builds the, the electric motors for the integrated electric propulsion system. One of the most fantastic industrial achievements of the UK, the integrated electric propulsion system for the Type 45 and the aircraft carrier. Now at risk again because uh, General Electric are proposing to close that strategically important site. These are things that need to be gripped by the Ministry of Defence and the Treasury because we're losing a war of attrition here on an, our industrial capability around the shipbuilding industry. Way. Yep, happy to give away. I thank the Honourable Member for giving way. I just want to touch on um, the capability that we're losing from General Electric. We've already lost one of the capabilities that was in my constituency in Kidsgrove. We were given assurances that the capability would be sustainable long term after its redeployment to, to Rugby in Stafford, and yet now we're losing it too. Industry just isn't supporting us in the right way if it's not part of a sovereign ca skills capability, yeah. and they know there's a steady drumbeat of orders. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I thank my friend for that intervention. It's, it's critically important that we look at not just the first tier original equipment manufacturers like BE Systems and Rolls Royce, where the government has golden shares and they can direct it to an extent operational decision making. But we need to look at the second and third tier supply chains as well, which, after all, uh, 3,000 people involved in the construction of the aircraft carrier project were in, in the supply chain. So we need to look at those industrial capabilities that are critical to maintaining sovereign capability. Um, it's clear that there's an operational decision by General Electric to move that capability to France. Well, it's not in the British national interest, so we need to make that clear to them, and we're not going to accept it. That's as simple as that, and it's the duty of this government to make that case. Uh, and if necessary, whoever leverage is required to make it change its mind. Uh, you know, that's what government's there to do, to correct negative decisions by the market. Um, that's what needs to happen to sustain our industrial capability. So my vision is that we get a better national shipbuilding strategy that looks to the future, that looks to the capabilities we need to sustain, and also ensures that we have a financial and a long-term capital investment proposition with the Treasury that reflects the complexity and long-term nature of shipbuilding programmes and properly finances them multi on a multi-year generational basis, and also invests in the capital uh, infrastructure required in our shipyards to get them matched. But it was the greatest tragedy that we looked at a world-class shipbuilding capability on the Clyde, which hasn't been realised. We're still building our Type 26s in that same old hall built by a Norwegian company to build gas tankers that they did in the 1980s. It served as well, but I tell you what, when they, built, when they did the business case for building that, that hall in the 1980s, I sure as hell didn't think they were going to be building aircraft carriers and Type 26 frigates in it. So we have to look at not just the narrow business case for a, a, one programme and the investment for building Type 26 in this shipyard. It's about all the other ships that are going to follow in its wake. This is talking about... a. 50 to 60 year capital investment programme and the huge industrial benefit of doing that is enormous and the Minister of Defence just has not addressed it I'm afraid and I hope the Minister will look to address that point in his uh, remarks to the, to the Chamber because it is crucial that we start to think about it in those terms. Simple silo mentality when it comes to projects isn't serving the, our defence industrial capability whatsoever. We need to have a much more broader view of it, much more integration to secure the skills base and our ageing shipyard workforce, infuse it with more apprentices, have a training programme that's sustainable and have a stable demand pipeline through programmes like the Fleet Solid Support Ships, which should be plugged in to take up the slack 
that's came out of losing the, or the downscaling of the aircraft carrier program. Similarly, why are we not planning for a proper replacement for HMS Ocean rather than retrofitting metric vessels? I think that's a rather foolish and, and superficial way of doing it. Let's properly build a, a new landing helicopter dock platform and also look towards the replacement of the Albion class as well in a similar way and build a world-class shipyard that's able to deliver it. That's what we need to do to pull all this together and really realise the industrial legacy of the Queen Elizabeth class programme, which was an exemplar for British engineering, a truly world-class and world-leading programme. And we look at you know, building the space shuttle, building the International Space Station, the Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carrier is up there with the most complex engineering projects ever undertaken by the human race. And we should be having great national celebration about that achievement. But let's make the most of the legacy. To Julian Lewis. Thank you very much, Tim. And uh, I must start off by congratulating all four speakers so far in this debate. Only one of the four at present time is a member of the Defence Committee, which I have the honour to chair. Uh, but we've seen from the depth of knowledge and the enormous enthusiasm brought by all of them that the Defence Committee will not be short of worthy members in the future and I would encourage those who are not yet on it to make sure that they redouble their efforts to do so at the first opportunity. The beneficiaries uh, are the House and the country as a whole of such enthusiasm and such breadth of knowledge. Uh, as a result of that, it doesn't leave me with so much to say as I might otherwise have said. That is an, an, additional, an additional benefit to anybody who might be watching this debate. And I will just pick and choose a few points here and there from what's been said already uh, and try and develop them into a little bit of a theme about strategy and about adversaries. And when I talk of adversaries, I'm really talking about one overwhelming adversary, and that is the Treasury. <laughs> and we heard, we heard only, uh, only from my honourable friend for Berwick-upon-Tweed that apparently the Treasury is now uh, thinking about the idea that no sooner uh, as having brought in one of the two largest vessels ever built for the Royal Navy, they might be thinking of mothballing it. Well, I suppose that's a little bit better than the proposal that I heard from one George Osborne in the run-up to the 2010 election, uh, which was that he would, I think, like to have scrapped the project <laughs> for building the carriers completely. And it is amazing how many times we have almost lost the ability to project air power for the sea, from the sea. And in one case, uh, notably, we did lose it. We lost it when we lost the invincible class of carriers. Now, uh, my honourable friend for Whitney, in his magisterial opening speech, uh, referred to the fact that they had been uh, termed through-deck cruisers, and he was rather critical of that fact, but in reality, I, I have, it's the only minor point of correction I would make to his uh, uh, exemplary uh, exposition, and that is that the, the labelling of these ships, which were from the outset aircraft carriers, capable of enabling the Harrier to still offer fixed wing um, coverage from the sea to the land. Um, the, the, the reason they were called through deck cruisers was to defeat the adversary. It was to defeat the treasury. If they had been called carriers from the outset, they would never have been built. Once they were, I'm glad to see he, he accepts that, uh, once, they, once they were safely in commission, and after a respectable number of years, it became possible to to reclassify them as aircraft carriers, which is what they were always intended to be. And of course, uh, we very nearly uh, had no carriers for the Falklands conflict. Uh, the reason we had the carriers was, as I say, a bit of subterfuge on the part of the Admiralty. Uh, when it came to the Libya conflict, a disastrously misconceived conflict as it happens, but nevertheless, when it came to the point with Libya, we had no carrier capability at all. And uh, I recall at the time uh, that when the decision was taken to have this gap between the phasing out of the Invincible class carriers and the coming into the service of HMS Queen Elizabeth, it was predicted that we did not anticipate any role being necessary for a carrier for the 10 years or so that such a gap would exist. And uh, uh, in a moment, uh, uh, and I believe it was something like 
10 months rather than 10 years when the Libyan scenario arose. And guess what? Guess what warship our French allies in that particular conflict immediately moved to the theater. It was their one and only aircraft carrier. I give way. What's the point about euphemisms? Uh, through direct cruiser, another favourite of mine is Capability Holiday, which she alluded to, and also Fitted For But Not With, which was a common theme on the Type 45 destroyer. <laughs> um, but does he agree with me that the issue of these Capability Holidays needs to be properly scrutinised? And I don't think that the Ministry of Defence has recognised the damage that the 2010 SDSR caused in terms of loss of maritime patrol capability and the carrier capability. Well, the, the trouble with 2010 was that it was a funded defence review that was totally unstrategic. Just as other people would say that the previous 1998 defence review was the reverse. It was very strategic, but almost totally unfunded. And this is the problem that we've got. We have an inability in times of peace to be able to persuade those people in charge of the national purse strings that the best possible investment they can make in the long term is to have strong armed forces. Because if your armed forces are strong enough, then you will not have to spend all that treasure, let alone all those lives, in fighting conflicts that often arise as a result of your perceived weakness. I'm very grateful to Aaron Franklin Way. He's made an absolutely outstanding point. I wonder if you'd just agree if I sum it up in this way, that we need to have a strategic look at what our strategic defence goals are and or in terms of what we want to achieve and then fund them, as opposed to having the funding and then seeing what we can still manage to do. I, I will go some way towards acknowledging that with only this one caveat, and that is that our strategic goals cannot be defined more tightly than the ability to have a full range of military capability to meet whatever threats may reasonably re be regarded as likely to arise. I'm afraid that all speeches that I ever make about defense policy and about military strategy come back to the same three basic concepts, deterrence, containment and the unpredictability of future conflict. And we saw that in terms of Libya being unpredictable, we saw it in terms of the Falcons being unpredictable. The only thing we can predict is that the vast majority of conflicts in which we will be engaged in the future, just like the vast majority of conflicts in which we've been engaged in the past, will arise with little or no warning significantly in advance. And that's why you have to have a comprehensive range of military capabilities and it's very difficult to persuade uh, budget conscious treasury officials uh, not to take a chance with the nation's security and that's why the defense select committee time and time and time again comes back to the same point which is that defense has fallen too far down our scale of national priorities and when we compare it with other high spending departments we can see this because at the time of the 1980s at that stage where we were facing an aggressive Soviet Union and a major terrorist threat in the form of uh, Northern Ireland and the, the insurgency that was going on from the IRA, at that time we spent approximately the same on defence as we spent on health and education. And now we spend two and a half times on health and four times, uh, sorry, four times on health and two and a half times on education as we spend on defence. And the problem that arises is that you can get away with that as long as things do not go wrong but if they do go wrong, then you live bitterly to regret it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It makes a very important point. Whilst I don't think that um, these decisions on spending are, are mutually exclusive, I think we have sufficient capacity in the state to, to fund, fund all these things adequately. It makes an important point about thinking we can get away with not properly investing. And I think of the, the predecessor of the, the new Prince of Wales, which was sunk by the Japanese in 1941 because it had fatal weaknesses in the battleships design because its air defence systems had been scrapped uh, for cost-saving measures in the 1930s. Does he not agree that's 
the lesson of history we ought to probably learn if unpredictable conflicts are to emerge in the future. I was wondering, I was wondering about uh, whether I should make a reference to that, that terrible event in December 1941 when the Prince of Wales and the Repulse were sunk, and they were sunk by Japanese air power. And, of course, one of the main uh, problems was that they were sent out with inadequate protection and with inadequate escort and with, a, as I've as I recall from my history books, uh, virtually no air cover or actually no air cover whatsoever. Um, now, uh, having said that, um, uh, we can say that HMS Queen Elizabeth uh, has already uh, claimed um, uh, one victory, I suppose it could be said, because given that the Treasury, is, uh, uh, as I earlier referred to, can be regarded as the, the main adversary, I think the Treasury has probably sunk more ships in the Royal Navy than any other enemy that uh, we have been faced with. Um, uh, it was gratifying to see a bit of advanced retaliation in that HMS Queen Elizabeth appears to have sunk the Chancellor's visit to the Communist Chinese uh, without even having embarked on its first operational voyage. But I was hoping to get, I was hoping to get a laugh at that point, um, but, but behind that is a, is, a, is a serious point, which is this, and, and it relates to what was being said by my honourable friend a moment ago in an intervention. The government needs to have an overall strategy. And the problem is that all too often it looks both ways with regard to countries that do not mean us a lot of good. Uh, let us take the example of China. Now, um, before I come to the, the more recent issue of their behavior in the South China Sea, um, let, my, let, let us go back to 2013. And in 2013, I was serving on the Intelligence and Security Committee. And the Intelligence and Security Committee devoted a great deal of time to a study about foreign penetration of uh, British uh, critical national infrastructure. That was the overall title of the report that we produced. But in reality, it was all about Huawei uh, and the way in which this giant Chinese communist telecommunication firm had uh, penetrated uh, British Telecom and been brought into the system without ministers having even been alerted until it had happened. Uh, and I remember being somewhat phased when within a matter of, it seems to me now looking back, a few weeks of the publication of that report with all its dire warnings about the need that this must never happen again, I saw a picture of the then Prime Minister David Cameron shaking hands with the chief executive of Huawei on the doorstep of number 10 uh, on the basis of some great new deal that was now being proposed. Now, we need to understand that if there is something so sensitive about the idea that a ship of the Royal Navy could even dream of going into the Pacific Ocean that a major trade trip uh, from the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the United Kingdom to uh, China has to be called off, then there's something terribly wrong, both with the attitude of the Communist Chinese in, in, in calling off the trip, as it were, and the attitude of the Treasury in wanting the Chancellor to undertake it. I'll leave the point at that at the moment, unless I get some in-flight refuelling from the Honourable Member. Does he think that the concept of ITAR, which is a NATO standard, should be extended to these sorts of spheres um, to actually address the, the insidiousness of this new penetration by foreign powers? I think that's a very perceptive suggestion. And I must say that when it comes to this issue of keeping the country safe uh, from uh, threats to our way of life, which now take on new forms that are so much more difficult to recognize because uh, they don't operate at a level that would automatically trigger the same sort of alarm bells as traditional military threats. Uh, I must say that the, the support that I find as chairman of the Defence Committee uh, from members of all four parties that are represented on that committee is absolutely outstanding. And I think uh, the, the House should acknowledge more than it does the high degree of consensus amongst defence-minded people in all the major parties, irrespective of occasional disagreements on specific aspects of defence uh, now and again. 
So I just want to, to bring my remarks to a conclusion by talking about uh, that 1998 Labour Party, um, Labour Government Strategic Defence Review, uh, which I described as unfunded but highly strategic because it was a very good review. If only the funds had been made available for it, it would have been an outstanding success. And what it looked at was this. <clears throat> at that time, in 1998, the threat from the Soviet Union had gone away, and it was hoped that we would not have to consider a major confrontation in Europe. And so the thinking behind that strategic defense review went something like this. Given that we do not anticipate our armed forces having to be engaged in the European theater in the future, it follows from this that if they are going to be engaged on a significant scale anywhere, it will be at some considerable distance from Europe. Given then that we no longer are a global imperial power with a network of strategic bases around the world, from which to intervene, it follows from that that we need a concept that enables us to have a movable strategic base. And at the heart of that uh, strategic defense review of 1998 was the concept of the sea base. And the concept of the sea base had two central pillars. One was carrier strike and the other was the amphibious task force. And carrier strike was to enable us to exert air power to the land from the sea. And the amphibious task force was to enable us to insert land forces uh, onto territory, likewise from the sea, taking the whole strategic concept uh, into a, uh, a way in which uh, that we could travel to the theater where the, the need to intervene militarily applied. And um, only a year ago, we faced yet another major potential crisis because it was widely being reported around about January of, of last year that the core ships, HMS Albion and HMS Bulwark, of the amphibious task force were going to be pensioned off 15 years before their due date. And I think I can honestly say that the most influential reports of the 27 so far produced by the Defence Committee uh, since I've been uh, chairing it was the one that we brought out in February 2018 which described the proposal to lose our ability to exert land power from the sea as militarily illiterate. And I absolutely welcome the intervention of the Secretary of State for Defense who could see the risk of what was going to happen. And there have been some people who have criticized the modernizing defense program as not having been quite as substantial as they had expected. But I say that that is to miss the point. Because although I welcome the concept of the fusion doctrine, which my honorable friend from um, Berwick upon Tweed uh, referred to, um, there was a way in which it actually posed a risk mm -hmm. to the future of our armed forces. The, the way in which the defense theory for the future was being amalgamated in the National Security Capability Review with the newer threats, such as threats from cyberspace, disinformation, and so forth, was conceptually sound, but economically dangerous. And I'll explain in a moment why, after taking an intervention from my honorable friend. Um, I think my honorable friend, and on, on that point exactly, the great challenge, I think, of the fusion doctrine, which, as he says, does have a really intelligent um, strategic vision, is that as ever, and it, it's difficult to say out loud, the adversary in, in the Treasury, uh, and indeed, uh, in my view, those who were driving that policy forward saw it as an opportunity to take hold of the defence budget and bring it into a greater whole without understanding fully the need that hard power must remain in our national picture. 
I am absolutely delighted that my honourable friend made that intervention. It's just saved me at least the next two paragraphs of what I was going to say. This was precisely the danger. The defence budget was being uh, in, in wrapped up inside an overall defence and security budget, and we were being told that that national security capability review was going to have to be fiscally neutral. So if you put together £56 billion overall, what this effectively meant was that if more money was going to be spent to meet the new sorts of threats that we're constantly told about, threats in space, threats in cyberspace, threats of disinformation that are not really new but are moving into new dimensions, if that was going to receive more money for every pound those threats received, that would mean a pound less for the Army, the Royal Navy, or the Royal Air Force. And that's why we saw those leaks of clearly authoritative potential cuts in each of the three services, including the loss of HMS Albion and HMS Bulwark. And that is what would have happened if the Secretary of State for Defense had not fought and won the political battle to strip out the defense elements from the National Security Capability Review and instead uh, have the separate modernizing defense program, which meant that he was no longer caught in that fiscal or financial ambush. So let us not be too complacent in congratulating ourselves on the advent of these marvelous vessels uh, because A, they very nearly didn't happen because of the Treasury way back in 2009, 2010, and B, even as we brought in half the concept of the sea base, namely carrier strike, we were in danger right up until a few months ago of losing the other half of the concept, which was amphibious capability, without which we would not have a rounded and overall capability to uh, intervene strategically in whatever uh, theater of the world some threat arises unpredictably. And believe me, when it does arise in the future, it will be unpredictable, and we will be very lucky indeed if we are sufficiently equipped to be able to meet it, uh, and that luck depends upon the advocacy of people such as those we have heard so far this afternoon in every single political party represented in this debate. And I'm hoping that um, my honorable friend uh, this from the Scottish Nationalists will be uh, intervening presently and will keep up that uh, <laughs> tradition. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brady. Can, can I say it's a pleasure to follow the chair of the Defence Select Committee, whose, uh, whose committee does such excellent work and produces such uh, outstanding reports which help defend uh, not only our country, but actually uh, the, the broader alliance to which, uh, to which we belong. And also in congratulating uh, the Honourable Member uh, for Whitney and uh, the Honourable Member for Berwick and uh, my Honourable Friend for Stoke, uh, Stoke North on their contributions to bringing this debate about. Uh, Mr. Brady, I, I too have been struck, as the chair of the Defence Select Committee was, about the unanimity uh, of view uh, and the power of the comments that have been made. I particularly wanted to take part in this debate uh, out of really, uh, and I say this as somebody, uh, as everyone knows, is a big supporter of defence uh, and increased expenditure, but some sense of frustration. And it's not frustration with with, uh, with the Ministry of Defence, it is the frustration with our country and frustration with government as a whole that the number of debates that I've been in where we've said it is crucial, crucial, that defence and foreign policy objectives and international development objectives are married together. And I want the Minister to... Uh, you have to take this away... But this cannot yet be another debate where we say this, and in a year, the uh, Right Honourable Member does another report, the Honourable Member for Berwick makes another outstanding speech, or indeed my Honourable Friends do, where we say it has to be that foreign policy objectives are linked with defence objectives. Because that's what's happening, Mr Brady. And I don't mean that, I'm not saying to the Minister, I'm not trying to make any sort of point other than a, 
than an opinion I have about what is happening. And that's why I wanted so much to be uh, to make this contribution. And that really is the main contribution that, that I want to make. I mean, it cannot be. Mr. I, I, well, of course. I'm very grateful to the uh, right, Honourable Gentleman for giving way. Um, I couldn't agree with him more. So can I, as an example of exactly what he is asking for, simply draw his attention to the recently published Africa strategy, which is a cross-government strategy drawn together a strategy from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, DFID, and the Ministry of Defence. This is exactly what is happening. Uh, I accept that that has been published. But you see, what I want to say to the Minister, and what I'll take it on, is to say something about the, the point the Honourable Member for Berwick made, which is about the UK citizen. But the point to say to the Minister, it just shows how much work has to be done. I mean, the, as the Chair of the Defence Select Committee, on the 11th of February, the Secretary of State for Defence makes a speech about where the new aircraft carrier is going to go on its first operational tour. And then a trip by the Chance Chancellor to China is cancelled. Now, I, I, you know, I, and then there's a furious row erupts, apparently. Now, I'm not saying that if that's wrong, that's wrong, but that's what was reported. Now, somehow or other, we either, we, we have to have a way of uh, there not being a row about this and the actual whole blame going on the Chinese for refusing to... Uh, accept that we have a perfect right for our aircraft carriers to go where we want. Instead, it became, well, yes, the Chinese shouldn't have done that, but why are we rowing about it as well? And I just say that as a, as a, as a, as a point. But the broader point I want to make, uh, Mr Brady, is not only about that we have to win this debate and argument uh, in government, is where on earth, and the chair of the Defence Select Committee has made it time and time again, so has the Honourable Member for Berwick, so is the, my honourable friend for Stoke on, uh, Stoke on North and the honourable member who speaks for the, Stoke, uh, for the Scottish Nationalists. Where, where, where is the engagement with the UK public about this? I mean, if I use my own constituency, they would see massive spending on tackling a terrorist threat as really something we should pile money into. The debate as to whether we should be spending billions of pounds on aircraft carriers is a totally different concept for them. Why, why should we be spending that money? I agree with spending the money. But have we won that debate with the British public? I very much doubt we it. We had it. You know, the, the, you know what, what, what we, I would say that there's a need for us with respect to Russia, with respect to China. The Middle East they might get, although they could say, well, you can already, do, you can already bomb the Middle East from Akrotiri if you want to. So, you know, you, so why are we having those? Now... Again, honourable members here have articulated the argument. I've just recently had the privilege of being, um, I think the honourable member was in Norway. I was in, uh, in the Falklands last week with the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme. The, 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 the self-determination of the Falkland Islands is, is absolutely uh, something which is, we, we can all be proud of and that our, our defence of that is, is something we can be proud of. But we do so much more, but who talks about that? HMS Clyde is there as projection of naval power. Wouldn't, didn't enjoy being on it much myself, but, the, uh, <laughs> oh. the, uh, the, uh, but they do a ph phenomenal job. But they're not only there in defence of, the, uh, of the Falklands. They're there patrolling the waters there, the South Sandwich, South Georgia, defending the Antarctic uh, Treaty, the fishing rights, and all of the other things that some other nations there are exploiting, or would exploit even more if we weren't there. Now... I just say, isn't that a role for naval power? But who articulates that in a practical way to UK citizens in a way that they understand? And I just think it's not something that the government should wake up to. It's something the whole of Parliament needs to wake up to, of course, the, to, in order to uh, address uh, much more fully, Mr Brady. Um, I thank my honourable friend for giving way. Does he agree with me? And he makes exactly the right point that actually a lot of what is done uh, through the Royal Navy's continuous deployment with those ships out and about across the globe is exactly as Clyde is doing, uh, environmental protection. 
Um, it speaks to those, my, my son's you know, generation, who are absolutely passionate about the environment and ecology and looking after our, our rare species and making sure that we leave our planet in a better state than we found it. Um, and yet we don't seem to be able to join up the importance of what looks like hard power, but of course, thank goodness, most of the time is not. Um, and is that a challenge we ought to be taking? Yeah, I, I, agree, I agree with that. And that that's, uh, supports the point I'm making and makes the point really, really well. But the use of the aircraft carriers, of course, is about hard power. In situations, again, we, uh, I'd say to the Minister, we ought to explain and put various scenarios in front of people and say these are the sorts of situations where we might expect the, the aircraft uh, carriers to be used when it comes to uh, hard power. But, of course, in the, in the, in the, the way uh, the, uh, the Honourable Member for Berwick puts, of course, there are so many other ways in which naval power or indeed military power of any sort could be used, including the environment, including the support uh, of human rights and freedoms. And indeed, as we've seen in the humanitarian efforts that have been made so well by uh, our armed forces over the last few years. But we don't, in my view, explain or exploit or, uh, that enough to, uh, if you like, to win public support, support or, or to demonstrate it. And Mr Brady, that is really the, the, the major point that I wish to make it's so important, and as I say, and I'm going to repeat it, my constituents understand why we spend money on tackling terrorism. And, uh, and as somebody who supports a much broader defence profile than that, they need to, and, and this, I criticise myself with this, you know, people like myself and others need to explain much more clearly to them why it is right that this country is investing what we do and perhaps should be investing more in our defence across the world. It is our, the, the Honourable Member for Whitney made a very powerful point about a globe, Britain as a, global, uh, as a global force for good. But what does that actually mean? I mean, we, we, we could explain it, but we need to unpick it, to actually say to people what that means, what it means across the world. How are we going to operate doing that with our, with, our, with our allies? And that's what I mean about joining up foreign policy, international development uh, and uh, defence. Did anyone remember once to intervene? He's very kind to give way again. I just wanted to, to add a point um, on the question of, of reaching out to his constituents and an example in my own. I visited a school, um, Ellington Primary School, uh, just a couple of weeks ago and the children had read a book about landmines and the impact they were having on the communities after the war was over. And they said to me, and they set me a challenge, as the Minister knows, um, to make landmines a thing of the past. Now, that's quite a big ask for a single MP, but I'm hoping that others will assist. But what was so fascinating is they were, they'd, they'd come across this story through a book. Uh, they had, to a man and woman, been completely transfixed by the story, and it had motivated 10-year-old political activity. That's what it is, that desire to do something better. And the challenge that uh, the Minister and I are working is to see if we can find someone, a member of the army, who, indeed perhaps the Minister himself, who is an expert in bomb disposal, to actually go and talk to those children about what it is that it is a military person, uh, that skill and that bravery that will help change the world they want to see in a better place. Well, well I agree with that. And the Minister, for, with his uh, distinguished background, would be somebody who would be much more able than me to, to be able to articulate uh, and, and to put that forward. But that, that is the, the, the essence of really what I'm saying. And it, it somehow, as a, as a parliament, we, we, we often talk about this, but it just does not ever seem to reach a point where somehow we have a scheme by which uh, we can deliver it much more uh, forcefully uh, than we can. Just specifically moving on from that, and just uh, in, a, in a minute or two, I just want a couple of um, points rather than uh, that big, broad strategic points to, to bring it down to. Can the Minister just answer a couple of specifics which I think would be, uh, would, would, would be helpful? helpful. Th this point about having two fully operational carriers, what that actually means. Does it mean having one fully operational task force at sea 365 days a year, 24 hours, uh, 24 hours a day. What, what does that mean, mean that the other carrier is doing? Is it, is it, is it tied up, uh, not mothballed, but is it there ready? Is it, do we have two because one, we always assume one will be in the, in the dry dock? Can the Minister explain what, uh, what, what we actually mean by that? Can the Minister actually say something about uh, 
what, what, what we're talking about, and just to confirm what we are talking about, about what the plan is for the number of aircraft on each of the aircraft. We're, we've ordered 48, uh, and the Minister will correct me if I get my figures wrong, we've ordered 48 uh, uh, F-35Bs. One presumes they're for all for the carriers. So that, uh, if I've read it right, two squadrons of 12, well, one squadron of 12, two squadrons on each carrier, so that all those 48 will be on those carriers. Is that right or is that, uh, that actually wrong? What does that mean for the purchase of additional uh, aircraft out of the, 100, the, the other 90 still to be ordered? What does that say? Are they going to be A's, are they going to be C's, or are they going to be more B's? Perhaps the uh, minister could say something about that. Could he say a little bit more about how he sees these, uh, as we move forward, the aircraft uh, strike group working with NATO uh, and the interaction between the different uh, navies and air forces uh, of, of, uh, of NATO? Could he also say a little bit more about this, uh, this, this issue of, of the aircraft carriers operating in literal space uh, and what that actually means? I know when I've seen some of the parliamentary answers have been, we can't do this because it... it it might um, uh, put at risk some of the operational capabilities of that and give... I, I, I do think that uh, sometimes you wonder whether the ministers retreat to that a little bit. I think that we need to know a little bit about what, what is the, the view of where, these, where the carriers will operate. And I've asked the minister if you could say a little bit more, in a little bit more, with more detail uh, uh, about, uh, uh, you know, about that and how they'll operate uh, with helicopters and with the loss of HMS Ocean and the, and the, uh, the various criticisms that have been made of that uh, and what that means for a helicopter landing capability from sea and whether we expect that to be from a carrier and if that is from a carrier, how near that takes them, etc. Cetera, uh, et cetera. They were a couple of the specifics uh, that, uh, uh, that I had uh, for the Minister with respect to that. But just to say, um, I say all of that as a great supporter of the carrier uh, uh, of the building of the carriers, the putting together of a carrier uh, strike group, uh, and we all wish uh, the defence programme uh, well. I do think uh, the whole thrust of what we've been saying, however, is that the government needs to look at what more it can do to ensure that our foreign policy objectives and our defence uh, uh, objectives that, uh, with international development are married together in a much more effective way and that that is explained to the citizens of the United Kingdom. Dr. Presti. Thank you, Sir Graham. It is indeed always a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I'd like to begin by congratulating my honourable friend, the member for Whitney, for securing this debate. I really enjoyed listening to uh, his fascinating speech. Uh, and um, and it, his debate is a topic or a subject which is of very strong interest to the many people of my constituency, engineers, scientists, and personnel from the uh, MOD DNS who have played a crucial part in realising the vision of a new UK national carrier strike capability. So, Graham, we are very fortunate to, both, to have both a world-leading manufacturing defence sector in our country, as well as the best armed forces in the world. Many countries operate, uh, many countries around the world use our forces as a reference for how they should train and operate. Our defence manufacturing industries ensure that the UK remains one of the top exporters of defence equipment and technical know-how around the world. And I think together this gives Global Britain a strong platform as we seek to renew and enhance our trading and defence alliances around the world. Now I'm particularly proud of the part my constituency has played in bringing a new national strike capability into being. Both the aircraft and the vessels have benefited and will benefit from the skill and creativeness of the men and women employed in and around Filton and the broader southwest generally. And if I may just mention a few specific uh, areas, Rolls-Royce's involvement in carrier strike supports several hundred jobs at their Bristol site in my constituency. The Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carrier MT-30 gas turbine and the anti-air Warfare Type 45 destroyer gas turbine are both supported by Bristol. It is also worth recording that or mentioning and getting on the record that the anti-submarine Type 23 frigates, which are powered by Spey gas turbines, are also supported out of the Filton plant. And the Stovall uh, derivative engines for the F-35B, which will fly from the Queen Elizabeth, were also designed in my constituency. And there's Talus as a founding member of the Aircraft Carrier Alliance, led the procurement of the Flyco, which is the glass flying 
controlling position fitted onto the rear island, which is the operational centre controlling all air operations. It links the ship's operation rooms, navigation bridge, flight deck and hangar operation centre. And crucially, TALIS provides the communication systems for both carriers. The systems from wireless on board to satellite connectivity will allow personnel on the ships to talk to each other, the aircraft, the rest of the Navy and associated task groups, as well as allies, civilian vessels and air traffic with complete security anywhere in the world. And BAE Systems has a network visualization site at Filter which allows the company to engage with the MOD and other customers in design reviews and approvals on an ongoing basis. But I would like to pay particular tribute to the work done in my constituency by over 8,000 dedicated public servants who work at the MOD at Abbeywood and who will have been central to the acquisition of the ships and the various sensors and systems on the ships and aircraft. Now, so, Graham, a national carrier strike capability is a very clear outward sign of our intent to pay an even bigger part on the world stage. I mean, we have heard much nonsense about Britain turning inward because of Brexit, but we have been a global maritime nation since at least the Elizabethan era, if not much before then. Now, our global connections may be underpinned by friendship and history, but these links are crucial, if not practical utilitarian. In a world where autocracies sometimes seem to have the upper hand, Quiet diplomacy must always be backed, I think, by a credible capability. And our allies quite rightly look to us to come to their aid when they are threatened or as a deterrent. Now, many countries enjoy the opportunity to train with British service personnel. This helps to enhance and develop good relationships which sustain a shared commitment to an open and inclusive world where many may be tempted towards appeasing or accommodating the more powerful countries who do not necessarily always have their best interests at heart or share our values. Now, I, for one, was delighted when the Secretary of State announced the decision to deploy Queen Elizabeth and a supporting group of escorts and auxiliaries in the Far East in due course. Yeah. I think it's a great reflection of our support for our allies in the region, as well as a restatement of the freedom of navigation on the high seas, which yeah. is enjoyed by us, which is a tangible benefit, which I think most people can understand, of having the, cap the capability and the carrier strike force. And I'm sure the Minister will agree with me that it would be great if the carrier is going east of Suez and to the Asia-Pacific Asia region. It would be great for her to visit Singapore during the 60th anniversary of the country's independence. I think it's 2025, showing the deep bonds between our two countries and actually will emphasise, again, our, our, our outlook being much more global. And we would do well to recall that the carrier strike concept is something which we need to develop. And by, by using F-35s, I think we've subsequently and since the beginning, cross-trained with US personnel on an ongoing basis, and that will only help, actually, the, our ability to be able to operate and uh, deploy with our key and closest NATO ally, the United States. Now, history shows us that we never seem to know where the next threat will come from, and in a multipolar world, we need to invest in capability that is agile and w which give policy makers and decision makers real, serious, tangible options. A carrier strike capability represents a real sovereign capability, enabling our country to make choices that support our own national interest. We recall the challenges that we encountered during Operation Elemy, the, Liber the recent Libya campaign, when it was very difficult for us to actually uh, operate on an individual, or, uh, and it demonstrated that actually without a proper carrier capability, it was going to inhibit our ability in the future to act unilaterally and actually act as well as we would like with some of our NATO allies. So we have an even greater opportunity to project the United Kingdom as a global presence distinct from Europe, but we will still remain a firm European ally who will vigorously defend the continent's freedom and security, if necessary, through NATO. Now, in conclusion, the UK's carrier strike capability will serve as a great way for our country to showcase some of the technology and innovation I have referred to, specifically in my constituency. We need many more of the outstanding engineers and scientists who have played such a central role in making the idea of a new sovereign carrier strike capability a reality, so we can enhance and increase our sovereign defence manufacturing capability well into the future. And it brings together the best of British, great people, great ships and great technical expertise and innovation. But aside from all that, we must always remember the purpose of our armed forces, which is to protect the national interest, our freedom, our way of life, and the security and the protection of our people. 
using lethal force if necessary. Now, I can't think of a better way of doing that than with our carrier strike. I can't think of a better way of enhancing our global position, being ambassadors for the world, and tying together, as others have said, you know, the three departments of the FCO, DFID, and the MOD, which is something we do need to talk a lot more about. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sir Graham. Uh, and first of all, can I commend the member for Whitney for an impassioned opening speech? And can I also associate myself fully with the words of the member, Honourable Member for Berwick, upon tweet in relation to my colleague in the Defence Select Committee, the member uh, for Stoke on Trent, for what they face and many of their colleagues face is an affront to parliamentary democracy, and they should have the full support of the entire. House. Uh, can I uh, also uh, say, in terms of some of the, the, what's been said in the debate so far, and some of, a lot of it I actually agree with. <laughs> <laughs> and you will have actually find in the Defence Select Committee, rather than one sort of rather glaring obvious thing, uh, we do actually agree on quite a lot. And I, I think the uh, member for Glasgow North East also point out the, some of the issues that are faced in Govan uh, in terms of the structure of the yard and uh, its, its, its kind of the way in which it's framed as a former Norwegian owned and specifically for oil rigs. Uh, and I think there's a legacy that I will actually go into in some point as a son of a shipyard worker outside of the city of Glasgow uh, and how that impacted shipping uh, industry across the whole of these islands. But I also agree with him in terms of incremental changes to structures. That also links to affordability and capability because capability is worth nothing if you can't afford it in the long term. Uh, uh, the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman, who is the Chair of the uh, Select Committee, a member for New Forest East, uh, um, you know, he, he, he's very eloquent in terms of some of the political dimensions. I'll maybe say a few more on that, but his chairmanship of the Select Committee is second to none, and he is very welcoming to all members, uh, no matter if we have some slight disagreements or on the odd occasion, should I say, uh, also, the Honourable Member for Gelding had talked about support. Uh, he, he, I, I couldn't agree more with him. But there's another element to that support in terms of not just the construction of vessels of any type, is also the naval personnel. And I'm sure he also recognises, as members of the committee do, some of the profound challenges we face in recruitment, not just to the armed forces, but across the, the entire armed forces, uh, not just the army, but the entire armed forces themselves. And the Honourable uh, Member for uh, Filton Bradley and uh, Stokes mentioned about the connection between local industry and the industrial complex. Uh, I don't think he'll find any disagreement. Uh, I, I think he's uh, correct. Uh, these are essential elements um, that we have to, uh, to consider. Um, also, there was a few um, anniversaries mentioned uh, at the beginnings of speeches. And it would be remiss of me as a banky, uh, Sir Graham, not to mention that today is the anniversary of the launching of the Duke of York from John Brown's shipbuilding company, the greatest shipyard that ever existed on the Clyde in the borough of Clyde Bank in West Dumbartonshire. Uh, my grandfather uh, worked as a, a riveter in the yard at that time. It was also a shipyard that gave birth to the mighty Hood uh, and also uh, to aircraft carriers, uh, to the Narnian class, uh, which a, a strike force of some sorts, and also HMS Indefatigable, which was launched in December 1942. Uh, 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 bear with me in just one moment, um, up to the honourable gentleman. In terms to the, uh, also the honourable member for Berwick and Tweed also mentioned the Britannia just as she leaves the chamber. Uh, the only th sad thing about the Britannia's retirement was that she ended up on the east coast of Scotland, rather where she should be, back in the borough of Clyde Bank. And of course, my father uh, uh, worked on that as well. To the honourable gentleman, I'll give way. Honourable gentleman, for giving way. Um, he's making a very good um, speech about the history of Clyde Bank's pedigree in shipbuilding. Um, you may also want to note for, for the record that the world's first aircraft carrier, HMS Argus, was built just downstream at Beardmore's at Dalmuir. Uh, it was a converted ocean liner, um, but that gave birth to the whole concept of the modern through-deck aircraft carrier. And it's a great tribute to the, the pedigree of Clyde shipbuilding in, in addition. I would also dispute perhaps uh, Clyde Bank, you know, Fairfield's got a good, uh, a good uh, claim to be the greatest shipyard on the Clyde as well, I'd say. <laughs> Yeah. No Glaswegian's owner ever going to win that argument with me, uh, <laughs> Sir Graham. And as to Bergmores, he, you know, he, he's stealing my thunder and my speech. You might have seen it earlier. Uh, Bergmores was one of the greatest shipyards as well, and, and it was actually ran the length from, basically, from Dalmuir, for where I'm from, uh, all the way into the borough itself. Uh, and its demise was also about bad planning uh, and ineffectual uh, uh, ministerial planning of the budget uh, between the two uh, great wars. Um, but uh, let's, enough of the history. Um, one, one, one little bit of it, you know, um, 
you know, I think it's as the son of a coppersmith who's an 85-year-old who still has his equipment in the garden hut, I fundamentally recognise the blood, sweat and tears of those who build the carrier uh, force, even in the 21st century, and they're to be commended for their sterling uh, work in which they have committed to in Rosai. And I'm sure the Minister also recognised that as there are three members of the Defence Select Committee here today uh, that the, the role of the carrier forces is well understood, not just in the committee, but in the House. So I hope the Minister will recognise some of the concerns um, as they head into service, which are highlighted to us. And, and maybe just one more from a, a, a former Chief of Defence Staff, uh, who said that the Navy says that in a, a high-threat environment, they will be protected by two destroyers, two anti-submarine frigates, uh, um, a submarine tanker and a supply ship. This is a huge commitment for a Navy that has just 19 destroyers and frigates and six available subs. So I hope the Minister takes that on board in terms of how we rectify any situation where we think that there's an inability to deliver up for two carriers. And then, in addition, Professor Roberts of Rusi uh, has also stated, um, and he says, it is clear that the decision to pursue two carriers at the expense, as he would see it, of everything else in defence has weakened the defence posture of the UK as a whole. So in terms of debate, how do we articulate that with the role of the contribution of the, the two carriers to, uh, 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 to the UK uh, defence? Um, in relation to the carrier strike strategy, I wonder also, can the Minister say more about the impact of what was already mentioned by uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman, uh, the Chair of the Select Committee and also the Honourable Member for Gelding, in, in terms of, of the kind of post Brexit trade talks with the People's Republic uh, of China, given that the Secretary of State's uh, uh, first foray, I suppose, uh, in a, some technical manner into the carrier strike strategy through his recent statement about lethal force in the South China Sea. In, indeed, the, the Chancellor uh, has said that the UK's relationship with China has not been made simpler because of that. Uh, and so I, I wonder if the Minister can tell us if this is a first foray or in, a, in, a, in a sense of the strike force was a success. There is, of course, uh, the issue raised by uh, the Honourable Member for Whitney mentioned decisions by the, the government, are, uh, and they're correct in terms of some of the decisions that have been made. I mean, if we look at in, in 1997, we've seen uh, a kind of overall uh, uh, around about 39% decrease uh, in the numbers of ships in the Royal Navy. Uh, 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 with a 46% decrease in the number of destroyers uh, uh, and frigates. Uh, and, and I want to come back to the point where the, the Honourable Chair of the Defence Select Committee and he and I fundamentally agree on this in relation to the North Atlantic. And I think he and some of my colleagues are getting a bit sick of me banging the drum about the North Atlantic, though I, I think he appreciates it, because there's a growing concern uh, that with a kind of type of refresh of the bastion theory by the Russian Federation, the North Atlantic... Um, it, needs an, it requires a fundamental shift in their approach to its defence to ma maintain the sea lanes of communication, I think was also mentioned by the Honourable Member for Berwick upon tweet. And, and fundamentally, one thing that we never talk about in transatlantic cable network that transverse between Canada, the United States, not only to the UK, but across to the rest of the European continent. So I wonder if the Minister could advise how the strategy would enhance capability in the North Atlantic and the High North. And as to capability, the Select Committee has consistently raised concerns about issues relating to the F-35 programme and the impact of expenditure. And there are consistent concerns of the uh, ability to deliver on the uh, kind of expected expenditure. Uh, for example, in the equipment plan uh, given at the Public Accounts Committee, I think it is uh, in 29, actually only in January of this year, stated that uh, the Ministry lacks the capability to accurately cost programmes within its equipment plan. Now, I, I, I recognise, as other members have stated, about the F-35s from the United States, uh, and I think that's a a great commitment that, that the United States is making, but that there are concerns about our own ability to, to follow up on it. Uh, as to the foreign policy at angle, uh, uh, Sir Graham, uh, the Honourable Member again for Boric upon Tweed uh, reminds us about that we are an island, and uh, this state is an island. It's a pity that that actually was lost out in the 2015 SDSR. And I, I do give the Secretary of State, and he did recognise that he wasn't Secretary of State at the time, uh, and when questioned about it, committee, and he fundamentally made sure that that was going to be corrected. And again, uh, the Honourable Member for uh, Berwick uh, upon Tweed mentioned uh, the North Atlantic, uh, the battle for the North Atlantic. Uh, and it's a stark reminder uh, of the strategic importance 
of the North Atlantic. And as I keep saying, uh, it's in the name, NATO, North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and I hope the MOD is able to tell us, and uh, again, as uh, has been mentioned earlier by uh, my right honourable friend, the, the chair of the Select Committee, about the issues about the Prince of Wales, though they maybe should have called it the Duke of Rothsey, um, <laughs> is, uh, is that if can real clarification as to its future, and if there is a if there is clarification on a sale, that that money is spent on a, a fleet for the uh, continued investment in the North. Atlantic. So, Graeme, an essential element of discussion uh, is hinder, uh, sometimes is also hindered by what I would say is short-term political planning. And I wonder if the Minister would advise us if there's any discussions in the Department about approaching our Scandinavian allies. And, and I've raised this again in committee, uh, and in my, from my own party's perspective, that it's an, a very uh, appropriate way in which to approach uh, the planning of uh, defence uh, uh, policy in a full parliamentary term uh, SDSRs. And whilst there may be one or two elements to that in which there will not be consensus across the House, the vast majority of uh, uh, defence issues I think we could coalesce around uh, uh, in which would gain parliamentary support across a whole five-year term of any given parliament. It gives consistency to those who are working in the field in the industry. It gives consistency to the ministry. It gives consistency essentially to those in the armed forces who we ask uh, to go onto the front line. And finally, uh, uh, Sir Graham, I wonder if the Minister also gives a commitment to Rathsyth being the long term uh, refitting home of the carrier force. Gerald Jones. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Graham. It is indeed a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And can I also congratulate the Honourable Member for Whitney for securing the debate uh, and for allowing us an opportunity to consider this very important capability. I can also take the opportunity to uh, as, as, agree with the, the points made by the Honourable Member for Berwick-upon-Tweed and West Dumbarton uh, and express my absolute uh, solidarity and support for my Honourable Friend, the Member for Stoke-on-Trent North and other colleagues. Uh, Mr. Graham, I think the passionate speech uh, laid out by the Honourable Member for Whitney gave us a uh, history of the aircraft carriers in the Royal Navy's recent history, uh, and also a call for the a national, national carrier strategy and for innovation in looking to, to the future. We've also heard this afternoon from a range of other speakers who have spoke with passion uh, about our armed forces, highlighting the support across the House uh, for those who serve Queen and Country and for, for the platforms that they work from. My honourable friend, the member for Stoke-on-Trent North, uh, talked about the exquisite ships that uh, she visited and made the point that we need the crews to staff them, a point that I will come back to later. She also talked about the, the need to secure employment opportunities across the UK and, and the need for a long-term plan uh, and to consider the, the steady drumbeat uh, of orders, which I know is something that the minister hopefully will respond to later. The Honourable Member for Berwick-upon-Tweed gave her overview of our maritime tradition uh, and an overview of the new carriers and their capabilities and her pride in watching them uh, develop and also talked about the, the need to have a clear strategy for, for carriers uh, in, into the future. My Honourable Friend, the Member for Glasgow North, gave us a very interesting personal experience in the shipbuilding industry, in his own personal experience, uh, and the complexities uh, and the constraints of the shipyards. Also talked about the need to look to secure employment weighted uh, in the support uh, and the supply chain right across uh, the UK, which I think is an absolute key point that we need to, uh, to, to bear in mind as we move forward. The Honourable Member for the Chair for the uh, New Forest East, the Chair of the Defence Select Committee, uh, gave a plea for new members of the Defence uh, Select Committee uh, and raised his concerns uh, about the 1998 STSR, which was unfunded, and the 2010 STSR, which was unstrategic, uh, and the need for having that strategic goal and the long-term uh, investment in our armed forces, a point that he's raised consistently and I'm sure will continue to, to raise in the future. My honourable friend, the member for Gedlin, uh, talked about his sense of frustration uh, and the need for 
foreign policy, which is linked to defence policy and the need for better coordination. And I think something that, that has been raised a number of times about the growing need uh, to better engage with the British public and win hearts and minds. Uh, and finally, the member for Filton and Bradley Stoke highlighted the, the point that many businesses uh, in the supply chain in his constituency and across the UK have uh, uh, contributed to the carrier capability. So, Graham, of course, in order to have an effective carrier strike capability, as my honourable friend, the member for Socon Trent North, highlighted, you have to have the necessary personnel. And since this is the, the first debate uh, that we've had, the first defence debate that we've had since their publication, could I ask uh, the Minister for his response to the latest personnel statistics, which showed yet another fall uh, in the number of Royal Navy and Royal Marines personnel? In 2010, the total train strength of the Navy and the Marines was 35,500, uh, but that has now fallen to just 29,100, almost 5% short of the government's own target for 2020 of 30,450. So I'd be very grateful if the Minister could confirm whether the 2020 targets for all services, but particularly for the Navy and the Marines, still stand, and if you could highlight perhaps how he uh, hopes to achieve uh, these targets. Rear Admiral Jerry Kidd, the first commanding officer of HMS Queen Elizabeth, who is soon to be promoted to Vice Admiral and Fleet Commander, and I extend my congratulations to him on that, has described recruitment to the Royal Navy as a constant battle. And based on the, the latest statistics, it is a battle that this government is losing. The announcement by the Secretary of State of two new littoral strike ships will no doubt put further pressure on an already overstretched Navy. So can the Minister confirm what efforts have been undertaken to buck these recruitment trends and to ensure that our carriers, our Navy and all our services have the necessary personnel to meet their objectives, namely to defend our country and its values and interests? So, Graham, the F-35B fighter aircraft will be an, an essential part of the carrier strike. However, recent reports suggest that a full F-35 carrier strike capability will only be delivered by 2025-26, some four years after the expected first deployment of HMS Queen Elizabeth. As my honourable friend, the member for, for Gedlin, referred to, could the minister now set out how this gap is going to be filled? And could he confirm that the government remains committed to procuring all 138 F-35s? The government's national security adviser, Sir Mark Sedwell, has previously said that the aircraft carriers would inevitably be used in the context of allied operations of some kind, uh, if used in a contested environment. The Honourable Member for Whitney made this very point in his contribution. So could the Minister set out how he will work to ensure interoperability with our allies uh, as the carrier strike capability uh, develops? Finally, uh, Sir Graham, there is the issue of affordability. The National Audit Office and the Public Accounts Committee have repeatedly warned Ministers of huge funding gaps in their defence equipment plan, between £7 and £15 billion. Pounds. At the same time, the Secretary of State has already proposed sending our carriers to the Pacific and has even talked about building military bases in the Caribbean and Southeast Asia, uh, among many other commitments. So I think Ministers can no longer delay making decisions on these important issues. So perhaps the Minister will agree to, to the recommendations of the Public Accounts Committee and come forward with a coherent plan to maintain the UK-based UK capability to develop and deliver the equipment required for the future by July uh, of this year. I look forward to the Minister's response. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And, of course, I should begin by congratulating my honourable friend, the member for Whitney, uh, for securing this important and timely debate. It has been a very good-natured uh, and, indeed, a collegiate debate. Indeed, I think we can certainly agree on two, two things that... Uh, the age, we're all delighted that the age of carrier strike has returned and that the Treasury are the enemy. <laughs> um, a number of colleagues have made uh, very thoughtful uh, and intelligent contributions and I must say this has been one of the best debates I've sat in as a minister for some time, uh, which is why I stand in slight trepidation as I have to make my own contribution. <laughs> Uh, there have been uh, a number of detailed questions. Indeed, uh, I will do my best, as ever, to answer some of them. Um, I have no doubt that I won't be able to answer all of them, in which case I will write, of course, to honourable members in detail 
Uh, but of course, many of the subjects which have now come out of this debate are worthy of debates in their own right, be that recruiting, be that the national shipbuilding strategy, and I cannot begin to uh, do those subjects justice, but I will hopefully touch some wave tops, if I may, that pun, no pun intended, uh, as I respond. Uh, but I will come to those uh, during the course of my speech. But we are, of course, a proud maritime nation, dependent upon global access to the sea to build our prosperity and project our influence. For centuries, the Royal Navy has been a vital instrument of sea power, ensuring our unrestricted access to trade routes and protecting our vital interests around the globe. Over the past 100 years, the aircraft carrier has increasingly come to epitomize the strength and ambition of leading naval powers. It is a statement of intent, a manifest example that a state is a player on the global stage, able to reach out and exploit the attributes of maritime maneuver, organic sustainability, and the speed and flexibility of air power to coerce or reassure. As such, the rebuilding of the world-class carrier strike capability offers a step change in our ability to globally project military power and constitutes a new strategic conventional deterrence. The United Kingdom's carrier strike capability has three component parts. The first two are the state-of-the-art Queen Elizabeth aircraft carriers and the cutting-edge fifth-generation F-35B Lightning combat aircraft which the aircraft carriers have been specifically designed to operate, as was highlighted by several honourable members, built from the hull up to accommodate this aircraft. The third element is the Crow's Nest Airborne Early Warning Surveillance and Control System, which will provide the eyes and ears of the carrier strike task group and enable command and control to the Lightning aircraft. So where are we on this journey? Last year, we saw HMS Queen Elizabeth complete successful first-of-class flying trials off the east coast of the United States, which followed declaration of initial operating capabilities and secondary roles earlier, this, earlier in this year. And I'll come back to the Honourable Member for Gendling's questions in a moment. She is now in Portsmouth, undergoing a capability insertion period prior to deploying to the east coast to conduct operational tests the first time we will operate frontline F-35s with the ship. Meanwhile, the HMS Prince of Wales is on track to be accepted by the Royal Navy at the end of the year. Last summer, we saw 617 Squadron stand up in the UK with the Lightning Force subsequently declared initial operating capability land in December. They are now developing their understanding of operating the aircraft prior to deploying with the ship to the East Coast. Crow's Nest is working to a challenging timeline to marry up uh, the other two components to enable uh, declaration of the initial operating capability, uh, uh, capability carrier strike in December 2020, prior to the inaugural operational deployment in 2021, the start of a 50-year life. The formidable F-35B will, of course, be at the centre of this. Jointly manned by the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy, it will be able to conduct uh, strategic attacks, support our troops and be able to work in threat environments hitherto unimagined by previous commanders. This is timely given the sophistication and proliferation of air defence systems in recent <coughs> years, but the Lightning can do, more and, uh, can do more and possesses an impressive ability to collect intelligence on enemy formations and threat, uh, threat systems. Just as importantly, it is then able to relay that information to other friendly forces working within and around the carrier strike task group, providing unparalleled situational awareness and so contribute to information superiority. And on the questions specifically regarding the F-35, as honourable members know, uh, to date, 17 jets have been delivered uh, and we do have approvals to purchase the first 48 of which we have formally ordered 35. Uh, and ultimately, we are committed to buying 138. Our 18th is due to be delivered in the summer of 2019, and I'm pleased to say that the program remains firmly on schedule. Our first frontline uh, squadron, as I mentioned, the 617, has already arrived in the UK, uh, and the operational conversion unit, those that have been working in the US, will arrive next summer. Uh, a second squadron, 809 Naval Air Squadron will join 617 uh, and 207 at RF Marham in due course. When it comes to ordering future aircraft, 
and indeed of what type they should be, be it B or be it A, uh, or indeed other variants, this is a decision we don't yet have to make. But I think it's important to note that we are literally starting a journey, and I'll come back to this point when we talk about the strategy. But up until now, we have been consolidating, as I've just described, the three elements for carrier strike. And now as we move forward, we begin the operational phase. And as that operational phase continues, clearly this is, this is a new piece of work. And we will see effectively how these squadrons work together, whether or not we need more Bs, or whether or not actually in future we'll, um, we, we will buy As. But that is not a decision we have to make right now. And in many ways, it would be wrong to make it right now before we have the experience of operating this platform. But it will be made in due course. Of course I can. Just um, in relation to uh, our future purchasing of more jets, uh, is the government considering at all uh, looking at purchasing C's rather than A's, which clearly have a sort of more bespoke outlook to them? Uh, because the C's we would then be able to fly off American aircraft carriers as well. And she makes a very important point about interoperability. Uh, and of course, this is the whole point uh, with the first deployment when we will have. Uh, U.S. Marine Corps jets on our platform. Uh, and we do absolutely have an eye to make sure that we do have that in interoperability. And that is precisely why we keep our options open as to what we will buy next at this point. To narrow our options right now as to what future jets we'll be buying, I think is simply premature. But these attributes, together with other forms of attack from the task group, such as long-range Tomahawk cruise missiles, uh, constitute a powerful ability to reach inland. All this in a mobile force able to range 500 miles a day uh, and at immediate readiness without the need to seek the permission of other nations for the land basing of our fighter aircraft. Once our Queen Elizabeth class carriers, including HMS Prince of Wales, uh, when accepted at the end of the year, become fully operational, and we've already highlighted that time frame, the United Kingdom will maintain a carrier ready to deploy at very high readiness, i.e. five days. And this really goes back to the question, I think, that the Honourable Member for Gedling uh, asked about how the two carriers will work together. Like any platform, uh, the physical side of the ship goes through a natural cycle, in this case being built, or in future when it goes into a long period of maintenance you then effectively have the force generation period when uh, manpower is, uh, and, and, and jets are married with the ship and you go through that training period because, of course, people always think about the platforms but they don't always think about people. People go through their careers and new pilots come in and, and junior, uh, junior sailors come in and you have to make sure that they are, as part of that process, trained in an appropriate way and then you go on a deployment. And after that deployment, you come back, you go into a period of maintenance, and that cycle goes through. The whole point of having two, where effectively you offset that process, is that at any one point, we will always have one at very high readiness. There may be times when potentially we have two carriers available, not at very high readiness, but a second carrier could, for example, go off and go and do one of the secondary tasks. Because who knows, as we said in the SDSR, what is around the corner? Who predicted um, Hurricane Irma in the Caribbean last year when we were then able to send a vessel to go and deal with that? But by having two vessels, especially being new vessels and following that cycle and offsetting that cycle, that's how we can maintain the flexibility to ensure that we have those vessels available to do a number of different tasks. And whilst... Delivery of carrier strike is absolutely main effort, the primary role. As I've just tried to describe, the inherent flexibility of the carrier enables a range of secondary roles to be undertaken should the situation dictate. These range from support to our Royal Marines undertaking amphibious operations uh, to discrete support to our special forces and, of course, as we saw, humanita humanitarian and disaster relief. This new capability will enable the UK to make an unparalleled European contribution to NATO, the cornerstone of our defence policy. Indeed, carrier strike is international by design. With the convening power of the Queen Elizabeth class carriers already evident, 
Other European nations have already expressed clear interest in exercising with, and more importantly, deploying as part of the Carrier Strike Task Group. Thus, Carrier Strike not only provides a potent additional capability to NATO, but also a means of coalescing European naval effort. It will, of course, also be able to operate with our partners' aircraft, a point made uh, by my honourable friend. This is especially so with our closest ally, the United States, where they will be embarking the US Marine Corps F-35B Lightning Jacks on board the Queen Elizabeth alongside our own uh, for her inaugural operational deployment in 2021. This level of close cooperation has been reached through extensive work over the past decade between our two nations, <coughs> requiring levels of information sharing and trust which are only evident between the closest of allies. And if I may respond to just one point which my honourable friend for Whitney said in his um, opening comments, which were excellent. Um, I've not heard a better opening to a debate for some time. Uh, he talked about, though, there being a loss of culture of carrier strike. I think I would gently say that this, of course, was anticipated, which is why, over the last 10 years, we've had many broad naval personnel and, indeed, uh, and indeed uh, pilots operating on US carriers so that we haven't completely lost that skill set. Indeed, personally, I was delighted uh, and honoured to go on the George W. Bush summer before last when it was operating in the North Sea. Of course I can. Oh, cool. I'm grateful to the Minister for clarifying that. Just to uh, clarify what I, I meant, it didn't, I didn't mean any criticism from 2010 onwards. I appreciate fully that we've had embedded people with the US Navy. I meant that in operating big carriers as opposed to the smaller carriers that we've had since the Invincible Day. So I simply sure. meant the changing culture from the late 1970s when we had the audacious class. But I think my comments just demonstrate how we are well placed uh, to bring this new capability uh, or renew this capability into the Royal Navy. <coughs> crucially, how well placed we are, and it's a point made by several honourable members, to ensure that we do have interoperability with our closest allies. And Carrier Strike not only offers political and military advantage to Her Majesty's Government and our allies, but it also provides significant ben uh, benefit to the UK industry. But before I get on to the industry element, let me just talk and touch on strategy, because this was a point that was raised by several Honourable Members. I, I gave just one example to the Honourable Member for Gedling as to how actually Government is genuinely trying uh, to bring across a Whitehall approach to formulating strategies in this area. Um, and this is something that we have already been doing with the carrier. As I've already said, for the last five years has been getting us to this point. Uh, but we do now have a cross-Whitehall strategy being formed about how exactly we should use this asset. And of course this all cascades down, I think, probably from the formation of the National Security Council back in 2010 which for the first time did bring together the different strands of government to try to make the very strategic and uh, uh, the very sorts of decisions which honourable members have rightly said that we should be considering. So the framework is in place. Of course, as we move forward through operations and gain experience, that framework will then be refined. With regards to industry, the... Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers have been built over six locations involving over 10,000 people, in addition to 800 apprentices, 700 businesses and suppliers. This includes 7 to 8,000 jobs at the tier one shipyards around the UK, plus a further 2 to 3,000 people across the UK supply chain. UK industry also provides approximately 15% by value of each of the 3,000 Lightning aircraft scheduled to be built over the life of the programme. This potentially creates a £35 billion net contribution to the UK economy and up to 25,000 jobs in the UK. In addition, the UK's role as a key partner in the global F-35 programme was reaffirmed earlier this month with the announcement of a major boost to the F-35 avionic and aircraft component repair hub when it was uh, awarded a second major assignment of work worth some £500 million by the US Department of Defence. This is an excellent outcome, and this new assignment will support hundreds of additional F-35 jobs in the UK, many of them at the MOD's Defence and Electronics Components Agency, uh, MOD Sealand and North Wales, where the majority of the work will be carried out. 
it will see crucial maintenance, repair, overhaul and upgrade services for an even wider range of F-35 avionic, electronic and electrical systems for hundreds of F-35 aircraft based globally. The Honourable Gentleman for Glasgow North East um, talked at length uh, and with great detailed knowledge uh, about uh, the impact and the tempo, if you like, and not losing skill sets and the relationship between government and industry. I accept that he clearly does not support um, many of the recommendations that the Parker Review and the National Shipbuilding Strategy has come to. And I think, really, for the scope of this debate, I'm not going to get into uh, procurement of fleet solid support ships uh, or indeed that relationship. But what I will say to him, uh, as he probably spotted in February, is that Sir John Parker has announced that he will do a review of that strategy and it's due to report later this year. So that probably, hopefully, um, at least demonstrates to the Honourable Gentleman that whilst I do support the strategy, we are not dogmatic in our approach to this and that we are prepared to review that strategy uh, to see effectively, sometime on, a one year on, how it's bedding in, but he makes important points. Of course. Just on the fleet solid support ships, we are a little bit worried on the committee about the fact that it is being presented to us and the country that the government has no choice but to run a competition. But other countries have built such ships, uh, such as France, uh, and they have not run competition and they have classed them as warships and we do worry about what for example Recife Dockyard is going to do between the completion of the Princess uh, of the Prince of Wales and the um, first refit of the Queen Elizabeth building such ships would be a perfect way of maintaining that capability and we hope these wider considerations are being taken into account Indeed, um, and I think that's a perfectly reasonable point. Indeed, I, I think I'm right in saying that the right honourable uh, gentleman wrote to uh, the Minister for Defence Procurement on the 26th of February and hopefully now has a reply to many of these questions because uh, he replied yesterday. I haven't seen it yet. Well, with the, well, in that case, without going through the letter, um, uh, I can assure him that uh, his questions, uh, as far as I'm concerned, have been answered in that letter. Um, the Honourable Gentleman also uh, made a number of uh, interesting points in his speech, not least uh, of all highlighting the historical necessity of carriers over the uh, many years. And I think probably, to my mind at least as a Defence Minister, uh, his comments about historic SDSRs, some being strategic uh, and some effectively being risen to budget, but rarely to those two factors that are meet. And I think if only we can get that right in the future, then that is probably absolutely key. I think if I may, uh, to conclude, um, Mr. Brady, Sir Graham, Carrier Strike provides new conventional strategic deterrence to the nation and is a powerful manifestation of Britain's desire to reach out to the world as a nation that remains a global player. It provides Her Majesty's Government choice in exercising influence through coercive power, as well as, being an, as well as being an effective tool to reassure our allies around the world. We must continue to innovate with our world-class capabilities of the Queen Elizabeth Air, aircraft carriers, F-35B Lightnings and Crow's Nest, to ensure competitive advantage and increase their interoperability with our partners. By doing this, we will ensure that this 50-year capability remains potent into the second half of the 21st century. I am conscious there have been a few detailed questions which I haven't addressed, but I will look at the record of Hansard and endeavour to write to honourable members. Thank you. Robert Court. Thank you very much. I'll, if I may just canter through some of the uh, points that really struck me during the course of this debate, which I've thoroughly enjoyed and I've learned a great deal. It really is the example of when we all come together with various expertise and can really make progress uh, in an area. Um, so I'm grateful to everybody for that. Uh, Honourable Member for Stoke North, I entirely associate myself with the comments uh, that others have made about her fortitude and I also um, look forward very much to the carriers being stopped, never mind about the aircraft, but with the crockery from her constituency, um, off which off which the men and women who will sail on the aircraft carrier will eat.
Um, and I thank her very much for her contribution. Uh, Honourable friend for uh, Barry Pond Tweed, many points uh, she's made that were excellent. The battle of the ground with the Great Sea War, and nothing much has changed um, in the importance of the sea. And she's quite right to draw attention to the Aircraft Carrier Alliance and that particularly um, successful, innovative um, uh, endeavour. Honourable um, friend from Glasgow North East, um, really enjoyed the detailed knowledge that he brought to this debate. And two points in particular, 0.3% of the space of an airfield constrained and destroyed a carrier. I've never thought about it in quite that way before. He's absolutely right. And the industrial legacy of the space shuttle in particular, I've, again, never thought about the carrier in that way, but he's quite right. We must make use uh, of it in the way the Americans did with the uh, space shuttle. Um, honourable uh, friend for the New Forest Two Chairs of the Select Committee, I feel terribly impertinent, Sir Grady, saying anything about defence in any room in which he's <laughs> standing because of his expertise. Uh, but the predictability of unpredictability, he's yeah. absolutely right about. And I loved his point, the treasure of sunk more ships than the enemy ever have. Um, <laughs> honourable friend uh, for Gedlin, um, foreign policy linked to defence, could not agree uh, more. And the engagement with the UK public, I hope at least in a small way we've started that today, but I agree with him. Um, links, same points made by my friend Filton, uh, links of DFID, FCO uh, and the MOD, I entirely agree. Both front benches, thanks for their contribution, both seemed a bit startled by the extent to which we all agreed in this debate. It, it does happen occasionally and uh, maybe we should all celebrate it uh, when it does. Uh, and Minister, thank you very much. May I must give you all your detailed answers? Could I just um, make my final request, which I think every one of us here has made in different ways, for an overarching carrier strategy that brings together all departments and everything that we've discussed about in one document that we can then debate and take forward. That's really the central ask from the purposes of today's debate. And I look forward to working, uh, Minister.